All right, it's been a little while since we did an update on the GameCube collection that I'm trying to complete now, and a lot of that's because you pretty much have to go on eBay at this point. I haven't had a lot of conventions to go out to and just pick up some games in bulk, even for some of the cheaper ones, but I have been accumulating over time here, and I figured we would go over some of the pickups that I've had here, and I think I actually managed to complete uh, a semi-rare set on the GameCube, which we'll take a look at here as well. Guys, if you enjoy these videos, make sure that like button helps out a ton. And if you're new here to the Spawn Wave channel, make sure you subscribe down below. And to start, I will be checking out this Prism HD adapter while we're going through this. This was sent over by Castlemania Games, and I figured we would check it out here with some of these games. I'll put some footage up on screen for some of them as we're going through the some of the pickups here. So if you're curious about this adapter, just check out the gameplay footage in this video. This is similar to like that Eon adapter. It's another good option. It's from Retrobit and it plugs in to that digital port on the back of your GameCube. Now I do want to start with an honorable mention because I did tell you guys I would try to pick this one up. It's not a GameCube game, um, but it is a game that I had been looking for. And since the PlayStation 3 games had fallen in price after Sony said that they were going to leave the shop open, I went ahead and just picked it up right away. And that is 3D dot Game Hero. So very happy to grab this one after it fell in price a bit to, I think, a more reasonable value. It is a really fun game, but it's also a bit harder to find. Anyway, let's move on to the GameCube games because I do go through the comments and from time to time we'll pick some out and actually go out looking for them based on your suggestions. And there was one that I found at a local store actually around here, which was surprising, and that is Teen Titans. Now, I have watched the show, but... I didn't actually play this back in the day and looking like on the back, it looks pretty fun as one to four players simultaneous. And I posted this one up with kind of the lot of games that I had accumulated. And many of you pointed this one out as being a really fun game to check out. So I will be doing that. Uh, it is complete with the manual in pretty good shape overall. The disc doesn't have any scratches or anything. And then I also have Medal of Honor European Assault and Tarzan Untamed. Now the rest of the games are all ones that I went online on eBay to pick up. It's starting with WarioWare Inc. And I never owned this game. I remember renting it back in the day and it's like a party game kind of thing. So it works well if you're having friends over like for the weekend, for example, and you maybe want something everyone can kind of hang out and play. And it is a lot of fun. I'm not the biggest WarioWare fan. Like I didn't really play all of the different games. Like I said, I rented this one and then I remember owning the Game Boy Advanced WarioWare game. This one though did start to climb in price pretty quickly. So I did pick it up for the collection. Now I also went ahead and picked up a lot of games and I'll tend to do that if it looks like most of the games in the lot I don't have because generally you can get a lot of commons and of course the shipping then is much better if you try to get them all at once rather than individually. So I do have a couple of those here with Enter the Matrix and I remember this game quite a bit actually back in the day because when this came out it was really hyped up as you know being part of, of the lore and it had like its own uh, exclusive film footage from the creators of the Matrix trilogy and it just it wasn't a very good game. I think a lot of us were really hyped on it because of the Matrix at the time, obviously, uh, but Path of Neo was much better than this game. I actually enjoyed Path of Neo quite a bit. Unfortunately though, End of the Matrix, not so much. This, however, is a dual disc game here. It did come complete with the manual and looks like they even included some cheat codes for me. So that, that's really nice. The, the manual's not in the best shape overall, but it's Enter the Matrix, so I'm not really sweating it too much. Then we have Curious George, complete with the, the free movie ticket inside. That's, that's something they would do quite a bit back then, I remember. They would package in movie tickets with a bunch of games with, they would have like movie tie-ins like, oh, there we go. Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, free inside one child's movie ticket. Like this, that was a common practice uh, back then. And then we have Call of Duty 2 Big Red 1. This is actually the time that we didn't have multiplayer Call of Duty much. This, for example, was a one player game. Now they did have some multiplayer Call of Duty games at this time, but we would also get ones like these where it was just all single player campaign. I remember enjoying Big Red 1 
quite a bit back then, but it's certainly a bit different than what Call of Duty is now. And then we have the Sonic Mega Collection, the player's choice version here, and there are just a bunch of old Sonic games compiled here on the disc. Just a nice collection. I believe I already have this one. I don't know if it's the player's choice version, but that's what happens when you buy lots of games. At times, you'll end up with a second copy of a game that you already have. And then we have GoldenEye Rogue Agent, which was pretty much EA's attempt at capitalizing on the GoldenEye name again. This is another dual disc GameCube game here. Manual looks to be in good shape. And I remember when this game came out, I just, I didn't really get into it. It had one to four players so you could like play against each other. And I remember they did pump up the AI in the game, even saying enemies controlled by the all new evil, E-V-I-L. AI mean no two games are ever the same. Oh, here's a good one. Do you remember Blood Rain? I think I had played this at a friend's house, but I never owned this game here on the GameCube. And I'm trying to remember what system I played it on. Was it the, it might have been on the PlayStation 2, uh, but I saw this online. It wasn't an expensive game or anything. And I figured, hey, might as well go ahead and pick this one up. But I do remember it had like slow-mo and yeah, here it is. Use slow-mo zoom and aura visions and you would battle Nazis, mutants, swamp creatures and ancient parasitic monsters. Also, strangely enough up here, it says one player, but it shows all four controllers being used. And I don't remember if this game had multiplayer. It doesn't say anything about it in the manual, so it's just a misprint on the back. And then we have some classics here, which includes the original Ikaruga. This is a game that's been moved up to a bunch of platforms now, which includes like the Switch and uh, the PlayStation 4. But back in the day, you had it on like the Dreamcast and the GameCube, and it's an awesome, arcade game to pick up. Uh, this one is complete with the manual and the disc, which looks pretty good overall. This is another one that has been climbing in price steadily on the GameCube. So certainly one you wanna pick up as soon as you can. And then we have Splinter Cell Pandora Tomorrow, another awesome title to pick up here. This one has the manual and the disc looks pretty good there too. And then of course, the original Splinter Cell. I already have Chaos Theories, so I just wanted to make sure I had everything finished up and complete. And I remember when Splinter Cell first came out, it like really set the tone for visuals this generation, not just like on the GameCube, but also even on like the PS2. And when Chaos Theory came out on the original Xbox, it legitimately looked like a next gen leap, even though it was still on the same system with that original Xbox. And a lot of that had to do with like the bump mapping and stuff they were able to accomplish there um, with the Xbox, but it still looked really good on the GameCube. And this one even is Game Boy Advance compatible. I never used that at the time um, with this original Splinter Cell game, so if you know what that was about, let me know in the comments. And of course, I saved the best for last, that being Mario Party 6 and Mario Party 5. Now, of course, I had to try to get all the Mario Parties because they are becoming increasingly rare as we've gone along here. These are two that I managed to pick up online, and the generally, I'll, I tend to try to stick to in-person pickups for these, so like at conventions. They look pretty good online and I'm happy to say that after they arrived, I went through them and, and they look very good in person as well. And that means that I have now completed the Mario Party set on the GameCube, which is something I wanted to do because these are becoming increasingly harder to find on the GameCube. And I mean, they're a blast to play. I know people have their favorites out of this set here. I really enjoy four. I posted up an image of five a little bit ago when I picked it up and I opened it to check it out and people were like, oh, that one's my favorite. No, 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 six is better, seven's the best. So everyone at least has their opinions as to which one is their favorite Mario Party on the GameCube, but I think this is like my favorite generation of Mario Party games. I know on the 64 it was a lot of fun and we have a lot of nostalgia for it, but something about the clean visuals, but still having the option of sticking with the basics with something like four and five or going up to getting uh, the microphone involved and other weird things they did with it. There's just something about this generation of Mario Party that was really fun. And I know we have Mario Party Superstars coming up here pretty soon, which takes a lot of N64 boards and mini games. They're remaking those for the Switch but I hope they have plans to do something with four, five, six, and seven, because I think there are some very iconic boards and mini games here that they could certainly turn into its own game on the Switch, or who knows, maybe off into like the Switch 2 or something. All right, so while I do have new 3DS games in here, I did pick a game 
from two other systems. I picked, uh, you can see down here, a PS3 game. And then I also picked a PlayStation 1 game. Mostly you hear, okay, brand new games, retro games, how are they gonna turn out? Like, how are they actually gonna show up? And uh, so far from what I'm seeing here, I'm pretty happy, at least from the top one here with how it's looking. This is the, you can see VGP, this is their 30th anniversary. They've been around for a while. So once I, I saw it getting passed around online, like the, the Black Friday sales that they were running, which uh, started early, I guess, but these games were marked down. So they, they, were, they were knocked down like 20, 30% in some cases. I don't know if they're gonna be running that sale again as they get more stock in, because what happens is they seem to get stock for these different 3DS, PS1, PlayStation 3, PlayStation 2 games, and then just as they sell out, that's kind of it, right? And then you gotta wait and see if they get more in. So uh, it's gonna be something you just have to check and keep up with uh, pretty consistently to get certain ones. Now I did pick 3DS games mostly because this is a collection that I really wish I had done more with just throughout its life. I, I feel like I didn't take it as seriously, like collecting for it. And looking back on it now, I, I wish I had just gone out, gotten a lot of the newer titles as they release. This is Shin Megami Tensei 4. Let's see, this one's sealed. It doesn't look like it's necessarily resealed, although I'm gonna play, I'm gonna, I mean, I'm gonna play these anyway, so I'll open one of them here uh, while we're going through them. Metroid Samus Returns, which I do have this game, but I actually wanted to get it sealed, and I threw this one in because I think I got to a certain point, and then I got free shipping on it, and this was pretty cheap. It's not like this is necessarily hard to find or anything, but I, I did like Metroid Samus Returns quite a bit, so I figured, you know, we'll get it sealed. This one I will actually leave sealed, though, because I already technically have the, the cartridge uh, opened up. But this one I didn't have, and I really like Tales of Abyss, but I remember playing this way back in the day, and I think I traded it in, or I don't know, something happened to it, but I loved this game on the PS2, and I remember when they announced it for the 3DS, I thought it was, this is one of those times where you get that game that you you have a harder time realizing, okay, this is a handheld game now, but I think it's just because of the PS2 generation where I played this. It, it was, it was, uh, it felt like a really big game that was then being shrunken down and put on a portable system. I just thought that was, that was awesome. And then Castlevania Mirror of Fate. This is a Castlevania game I have not played actually, but people have told me about it. So I figured why not? I'll, I'll pick it up while I'm trying to apparently just get different uh, different 3DS games. Well, I know I'm gonna play Tales of Abyss, so let's let's pop this one open. And there we go. Uh, it's it's weird, right, to see a manual here. on the, This is how it used to be, I promise. You get your game and your manual. It looks about what I expect for a brand new sealed game, you know, new, in good shape. Uh, but it is really funny to think that it's such a surprising thing now to see a manual, and I mean this. This is a this one looks nice. I mean it's fully colored on the front and back. Inside it's just they just have it as black and white. But it, it's so funny because for the longest time, decades, you expected to have an instruction manual inside, and now people just don't even. Really, I mean people are buying less and less in terms of physical copies. So never mind just the the manual at all. But it's it, it is sort of funny that we're to the point where. It's, it's just kind of a lost art to have a really good manual that, that comes with your game. I'm gonna check out Shin Megami Tensei 4 as well. This one was already kind of like peeling open a little bit on this side, but let's pop that one open. And this is where they didn't necessarily have the manual like included here. It was actually like on the cartridge. So yeah, not even the 3DS games were safe. They were eliminating manuals throughout this generation the whole way. So I mentioned I had a PS1 game and I also had a PS3 game. Now I got Jack and Daxter collection. I, I didn't have this in my PS3 collection and I specifically picked it up because it is a 3D compatible game. And I do have the PlayStation TV. I've been meaning to get around to doing a video on it, but as I was kind of working up to that, I was just picking up different games that had the 3D compatible uh, tag on it. And how can you go wrong with the collection of Jack 1, 2, and 3? And this is, this is definitely not one of the standard PlayStation 3 cases. I, I guess as they did reprints, they sort of changed them up a bit. Even like the spindle here where you push down, it feels... It feels cheaper, I guess. I don't know, it's kind of strange. I do like the reverse cover art though here with Jack, one, two, three, kind of in this line and chronological order. But yeah, I'll be, I'll definitely be checking this out. And I'm curious how this looks 
on the on the 3D TV. Sometimes you get a game on there and it's actually pretty impressive. Other times I'll admit the 3D effect does not hit well. And then finally, a brand new copy of Final Fantasy IX on the PS1. This is actually not a new thing necessarily in the past couple of years. I've seen these pop up on places like Amazon or eBay or even Square's own store, but they do sell out pretty quick. And it's, it's funny because these are reprints that have happened. And I mean, even like the shrink wrap isn't great. <laughs> you can see kind of the seal here. It's, it's very basic stuff that People, honestly, people might be doing with like a heat gun or something in the factory. All right, here we go. And here's the funny thing. They just put them on CDs now. So remember we had the, the CDs back then that were just all black bottom. So they had like the dye and it was to give it a, a distinct look. And they just threw that out the window for these reprints. These are legitimately just on basic CDs that they set up and design so that they do work with the PS1. So you can put this in your... PS1, your PS2, your PS3, and it'll work fine. They still stick with, of course, the greatest hits. Although this looks more lime green, I feel like, than the classic one. I guess that could have just faded over time, but it'll still have the manual, which is, again, really cool to see that. They didn't just throw the manual out, because obviously they, they could have done that. But it, I don't know, it's still pretty cool to be able to get a brand new copy of Final Fantasy IX. I, I've seen, I feel like I've seen eight pop up in their store as well, but nine is very, very common alongside of one of the collections. It might have been Origins. And typically this isn't very expensive. And I know you can get this digitally pretty cheap now on different sales, but a lot of times you can find this for like $15 or so on sale. Sometimes on Amazon, when a batch of them pops up, they'll even be prime shipped and they'll show up the next day. But overall for the 3DS games, Shin Megami Tensei 4, Tales of the Abyss, Castlevania, Lords of Shadow, Mirrors of, Mirror of Fate, and then Metroid Samus Returns. Okay, we're gonna start with the Game Boy Advance game that I picked up, Legacy of Goku 1 and 2. It was released here as like, like a compilation cartridge. Obviously they went like Legacy of Goku 1 and then 2, Boo's Fury and all of this, but while Boo's Fury was my favorite one out of the series, Dragon Ball Z Legacy of Goku, it, the entire series is a lot of nostalgia for me. Really enjoyed playing it back in the day on the Game Boy Advance, and I've been meaning to go back to it even though I, I know it hasn't aged the best, but having like the Game Boy player on the GameCube and going through that or even GBI, uh, I, th I thought it'd be a lot of fun to, to check it out. So I saw it there, thought I'd pick it up for the collection. Now the next couple of pickups are actually gonna be giving away some of the ideas I have for videos coming up, which includes the Game Genie. I thought it'd be fun to do an entire video just going over some of the different Game Genie cartridges like these, like this is for the Game Boy, and sort of how they work, open them up and all that. This one was kind of cool because, well, page is coming out of it, uh, it did come with the book. So back then, uh, you would basically rely on the little books that would come with these, or the ones that you would buy, like the cheat code books, in stores, because at, at this time, people weren't exactly online on like different forums and stuff necessarily just sharing codes later on in the 90s they were but like at this point you are pretty much limited to word of mouth on the playground or these terrible little books that kind of break apart that came with it and of course to go along with that i also found the game genie for the game gear so this does have one of those books again a common theme for game genie i, I think they basically did this with the different handheld ones because I also picked up the Game Genie for the Super Nintendo and you'll notice there is no little book with this one that's uh, inside of it. This is from apparently Cash Converters. That's not like where I actually bought this one from, but it's also fun to see kind of the, the labels. I actually got this one at a good, good price and probably helped that it wasn't exactly the cleanest cartridge at too many games, uh, but still it was good just to get more of the Game Genie cartridges to sort of do a video on. I think this will be a lot of fun when I get around to it, when you open these up and take a look. I know most people bought the Game Shark to basically hack up Pokemon. I'm not really sure what other games people were really using it for though. I, hey, there's Mega Man in Dr. Wily's Revenge game and Mega Man 2. Infinite Lives, yeah, that would probably help a bit. Now another series I'm working on right now is just weird cartridges. I thought that could be kind of a, a fun multi-part series as we go along. And whenever I see a, 
a Game Boy or a Game Boy Color game looks kind of weird like this. This one specifically, Ready to Rumble Boxing, has the battery compartment here because it does have a rumble motor, which you can see up here. Thought it'd be fun to, pick, again, pick these up, take them apart, talk about them a bit. I, I know the one that most people remember when it comes to sort of the rumble motor was uh, Pokemon Pinball. That's the one I would think of. So I saw this and realized, yeah, obviously it takes a battery for the rumble motor. Have not played this on the Game Boy, so I was curious to see how that would play into it. I assume when you get hit, or maybe when you hit people, it'll shake the entire Game Boy. Oh, and of course, I did spot an AGS 101 Game Boy Advance with the official Nintendo charger. It wasn't at a bad price, and I think that's because up and left, don't necessarily work the best, but I was kind of looking for some project Game Boy uh, systems, ones that I could do shell swaps on or little projects. Like, if, for example, Boxy Pixel has that full metal like, like shell that's completely hinged, so I'll just replace this and should look pretty premium. And I was kind of looking around for one that I could do that with. In fact, this one looks like it's already been shell swapped, or at least the buttons look a little different here. It also feels different, and it is missing the sticker back here, which is something that people tend to forget about when they are doing these shell swaps, but otherwise it reads games fine. And it's an AGS 101, which means you do get the nice brighter screen. You can hear the speaker coming up. So the, the fact that I can kind of work from this of what's, I mean, a very sought after model for the GBA, the SP, yeah, I'll, I'll work around the, the buttons, which obviously when I open it, I'll check it out and attempt to fix it. But maybe we'll do that again in, in a video down the road where I get the boxy pixel, full metal hinge GBA shell in and we try it out. Now I did mention that I picked up some GameCube games and I, I picked up three of them. One was a more sizable purchase. The other two are a bit cheaper. For example, the Scorpion King, I've never played this. I didn't have it in my collection, so that was the main reason. I was like, you know, let's just go ahead and, and grab it, obviously, to go alongside with the Scorpion King movie. And looking at the back of it, it definitely looks like a 3D action platformer of that era. And I don't mind that. I, I think while they probably haven't aged the best overall, especially obviously visually, presentation-wise, all of that, it's, it can still be pretty fun. Like, I'll still go back and play Prince of Persia, Sands of Time on the GameCube, and I, I think it's still a blast, right? So I, I don't know if I'm gonna spend a ton of time with this one, but I will boot it up and just try it out and, See how this one went. It, it was complete and everything. The disc looks fine, so good news there. And then the other cheap game that I got was Tomb Raider Legend. I actually picked this up at the same booth that I grabbed the Game Gear Game Genie, and it was one of those situations of, I'm gonna pick this up, can you throw this in and make it cheaper? Because it, it doesn't have a manual inside, right? So I'm missing that. And the disc isn't in the best shape overall, has some scratching and, and stuff on there, but they took care of me. They made it a uh, quite a bit cheaper and threw it in alongside of the Game Genie. But this was an interesting release because it came out after what happened with uh, Tomb Raider, Angel of Darkness, which uh, didn't go over well. So this was more of a return to form for the Tomb Raider series. They brought in uh, Crystal Dynamics, I, I believe took over at this point. And I thought they created a, a pretty good Tomb Raider game, all things considered, again, coming off of Angel of Darkness, which did some damage to the franchise. So I didn't have it on the GameCube. I believe this was on the Xbox 360, and I think that's where I actually played it back in the day. And uh, since then, it's also, I believe, been moved to the PlayStation 3 and all of this, but... Tomb Raider fan, so thought I'd at least grab Tomb Raider Legend. And then finally, the sizable purchase, I guess you can say, Sonic Adventure 2 Battle Complete. This game continues to go up and up and up and up in price. I kept putting it off because I have this loose and the disc barely works. Like it's one of those situations of you have to turn the system off, turn it on, have it try to read over and over and over again, and eventually it'll kick through and at least get you into the first level. I said, you know what, I, I wanna have Sonic Adventure 2 Battle complete because there's a lot of nostalgia there for me. And this one is like extra complete, has the register online, little pamphlet piece of paper, the disc, looks perfect, like there, there's barely a scratch, if at all, on this thing. And it, it's one that I have a lot of fond memories of, going from the Dreamcast with Sonic Adventure 2 there, and then to the GameCube where a lot of the Sonic games went. 
Uh, it, it was an awesome title to pick up. And I mean, the first level is super iconic. It starts you off snowboarding down a highway, just ha having trucks going flying off of you, bouncing all over the place. But definitely an awesome title to have for the GameCube. And it just, eh, with most of these GameCube games, it's getting harder and harder to go and pick up a bunch of really good ones because they're all becoming so expensive. So this was technically that 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 more expensive game that I decided to finally pick up and add to the collection complete. So the box he sent over, it's, it's pretty sizable. It's like 20 some odd pounds and uh, shout out to, I think it was UPS, USPS, or the mail service, whoever threw it at my door basically and ran off. It like ripped the entire corner up here uh, and it was kind of open, but MVG did a pretty good job boxing it, bubble wrap, all of this. So a quick glance inside, nothing was really damaged. <laughs> so let's, I guess, just open this up. I also have the Xbox here that I did the HDMI modification on a monitor. I thought we would pop a few of these games in just to check them out because I think the original Xbox has aged pretty well, especially comparative to like the PS2, the GameCube, did pretty well too, but like the original Xbox had a lot of things when it came to performance advantages and, and all of those as was the most powerful system at the time. Wow, and right away, MVG came through. Look at this. The Steelbook case for the uh, Halo 2. If you remember this launch, this was massive at the time. I mean, Halo 2 is still really, really good. Is this says, please contact Xbox Australia. Did he? He sent me the PAL version of Halo 2. MVG gets this bucket hat, and all of a sudden, he, he, he's doing things like sending PAL copies of Halo 2 out and downsizing his collection. Coincidence? I don't know. I mean, he came up with some pretty good ones. I got the Street Fighter Anniversary Collection. This has Third Strike, and I, I wasn't a big fighting game guy, but my friends played this a ton. It had like online play as well, and. If I remember right, the online play was all right. They had like scoreboards and even voice chat at, at the time, which was pretty cool. And that one's complete. That's that's a pretty good copy there. I mean, I'm looking through this and pretty much everything is good. Like I'm not seeing a bunch of sports games or anything. Here's Castlevania, Curse of Darkness. Oh, here's Black. If you remember this game, this like blew me away at the time when it released. It was from EA, which, EA's fallen off a bit now, obviously, but like back then they were dropping some really good games this generation, but this one in particular visually was extremely impressive. There's 480p, but when you're playing it, it, it just, it gave off a whole different graphical level from what we were used to at the time. You know, I never played Justice League Heroes. I always saw this on store shelves and I never tried it out. I just assumed it was a, a standard beat em up. This one is a 720p actually, you know what? Maybe we'll pop this one in. All right, so here we are in Justice League Heroes. Again, never played it. Standard, it looks like a standard just beat em up style game. All right, so I'm Superman, I can fly. See, so I have Batman with me. Punch, punch. Oh. Yeah, this is, this is a lot of what you got during this generation, which isn't, a, I mean, isn't a bad thing. It's a standard like 3D style beat em up game with uh, RPG elements to it. Like there's, bunch of options around experience, split even, and damage numbers, and all of this. And a lot of it was couch co-op then. Especially with like third party games because they didn't necessarily leverage like Xbox Live as much, or uh, or PlayStation 2's online, or the GameCube's was pretty much non-existent. Access my powers. Oh. Oh yeah, I got like heat vision. I got like the, the ice breath. I, I honestly believe it's it's pretty serviceable. It does not look bad, really. I mean, it looks like an Xbox game, but not like a blurry mess or anything. And yeah, I know I'm using the, the HDMI connection, which really helps clean up the image. But if you had like a standard HDMI connection to the back with like a, a third party cable, you would still get a, a decent enough picture. Certainly one that I think would translate pretty well to like a larger screen now compared to using like composite cables to get it done. So like you have a little menu here where you can go through and upgrade your powers and ability. Kind of reminds me a little bit of like X-Men Legends. I wonder if this was just them just trying to do a take on that from like WB Games and DC. Although it does say it's just one to two players. So unfortunately it doesn't take advantage of the four controller slots. Oh, Deus Ex. I, I know looking back on it now, this <laughs> compared to the PC version, not nearly as good, but 
at the time, getting Deus Ex on, especially this one in particular, on a console was really impressive. This didn't go to like uh, the, the PS2 or the GameCube. For a while there, the Xbox was getting what I guess you consider like impossible PC ports, things like Half-Life 2. Got Panzer Dragoon Orta in here, and this, was one of the one of the results of the Sega Microsoft partnership when that original Xbox first launched. There's Panzer, there's another disc underneath. Another PAL copy of it. How many bucket hats does this guy have? Got Tony Hawk Pro Skater 4, another game actually that's 720p. I I feel like that was this progressive scan on the GameCube. This might be another one to check out. I just really like the Tony Hawk uh, Pro Skater games, obviously at the time. Again, we've taken a massive step back with things like Tony Hawk Pro Skater 5, but at least Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1 and 2 that came from Vicarious Visions was pretty good, but I'm curious about some of these 720p games and how they look through this HDMI port. Okay, Tony Hawk Pro Skater 4, a game series that needs no introduction at all, and just initial impressions looking at it, it does look quite a bit better than what I remember it looking like on like the GameCube. Yeah, this looks a lot cleaner. And that's, like I said, that's kind of what you're gonna find with uh, a lot of these Xbox games is you're gonna most likely get the best version of the third party titles, just because the system was more powerful at the time and offered, uh, I'd say better video options when it came to uh, like HD resolution, widescreen. Not that the other systems didn't have like progressive scan on the GameCube or, uh, higher resolution on the PS2, because the PS2 had games that were just like 1080i. I, I know Gran Turismo was up there with higher resolution, um, but I know the original Xbox just felt more like a, a much more powerful system at the time. And even still now, like this is very noticeable how much better Tony Hawk Pro Skater 4 looks. And performance wise, uh, probably gonna be about the same, I would assume, since they really went for like a higher frame rate smoother experience with Tony Hawk games, but other games that uh, maybe have frame rate issues on other platforms won't have this, at least as much of an issue on uh, the original Xbox here. I'm trying to think of what my favorite Tony Hawk Pro Skater game, I've, two obviously, but like on this generation when they were really like getting started, I Underground was good, but I don't know, something about three, maybe it was that initial like, like wow, this looks really impressive even on the PS2 when I first saw it but like 2X on the original Xbox. That, that is a good one too, just because it's, it's basically the Xbox version of two. But again, a good experience here for Tony Hawk Pro Skater 4 720p on the original Xbox. Although I will admit, I think I like the controller more on uh, the PS2 for the Tony Hawk games. Probably just because I was so used to the original PlayStation uh, for like Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2. Another big one was Chaos Theory. It looks way different on the Xbox compared to the GameCube or the PS2. There's NBA Jam. I never played this one. I like NBA Jam, but I, I never actually grabbed this generation of it. So maybe I'll check that one out. There's I Ninja, which is a super underrated like 3D platforming game. Definitely recommend checking that one out. Mech Assault 2. Lone Wolf, that is, it's a 16 by nine. You don't see a lot of those widescreen games either. The good version of 13 before they decided to destroy it with the recent remake of it. But we haven't blitzed the league in here. If you remember playing this, it was uh, certainly a different take on like the arcade football games. <laughs> you had like characters getting steroids on the sidelines. They had like the X-ray of people getting their bones broken and stuff. But I actually remember having a blast Specifically with this one, the first one, I'm trying to think that I play it mostly on the original Xbox or the 360. I, I just remember playing it quite a bit back then. There's the other impossible port for P from PC, Half-Life 2. Forza Motorsport, pretty much where it all started right there. This is another PAL copy. Here's a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 Battle Nexus. This has up to four players. Looks like a, kind of like a 3D beat em up style game, that could be interesting. Well, I also played a ridiculous amount of true crime Streets of LA, and it looks like this is a game that's not only 720p, but 16 by nine widescreen. Maybe we should check this one out too. Well, it's been a long time since I've played this game. I'm curious about the controls and how they're gonna hold up compared to what we're used to now. I mean, that's the biggest thing. If you go back to some of these older games, control schemes have gotten so much better since like the mid to early 2000s. So I'm doing like this targeting, like training now, and I already have a feeling it's uh, 
it's gonna be a bit weird when we get out to the open world. So I immediately have an issue with the camera. For some reason, it's like, it's like going left rotates it the other way that I'm expecting. It's, it's very strange, but driving in the car, you gotta hold A. It's not like the right trigger, because the right trigger, you just start firing wildly into the air when you start pressing that in your car. I'm supposed to be driving somewhere, by the way, and I'm not even paying attention. Oh, okay. So I'm just taking out trees now. Uh, yeah, the <laughs> frame rate was still an issue back then in like open world scenarios like this. But this was a game that even back then, I know we had like Grand Theft Auto 3 and probably Vice City at this time. I'm trying to remember the exact year this came out in, but like this was still really fun. I mean, the shooting is still a little strange. You got like a diving move that everyone would use. The hand-to-hand -hand combat was better than Grand Theft Auto at the time. The open world still a little empty, but there were more things you could do in it. Like you, like you could arrest people. There were chases that would happen, and it was, it was, it was a good game for its time. I didn't play the follow-up. I think it was New York City. I just remember spending a lot of time with Streets of LA. Yeah, visually it looks like an original Xbox game, but I again I. I think it's serviceable even for now, especially if you have a, an HDMI connection like this. It's 16 by nine and 720p. Absolute classic Mortal Kombat Shaolin Monks. This one desperately needs some kind of remaster, remake, just anything. I mean, can you imagine this with full online play? I mean, there was a ton to this game. Absolutely loved it. Great game. You could sit down with a friend, couch co-op and play through. It was a very different Mortal Kombat experience. I remember they put like a demo out or there was a demo. I'm trying to think if it was on a, a disc, if it was on a game, um, but it, it kind of played through the initial part against Baraka. And then he got towards the end of the demo and there was like a sword on the ground and you both looked at it, went to jump for it and they just cut the demo there. I'm not sure why that's always stuck with me for the, the demo itself, but this game, was phenomenal. Completely recommend picking up and it's 480p, so we'll be checking this one out. All right, here we go, Shaolin Monks. One of my favorite Mortal Kombat games. I know it sounds weird because there've been some good just straight up fighting games for the series. This was just such a different take on the overall Mortal Kombat franchise. And they've tried stuff like this before with like, what, Sub-Zero Mythology or something, it, not as good. This was it right here. And it's funny as I went into content, back at the, then they had a lot of stuff you unlocked in different crypts, like with Deadly Alliance and Deception, all this, but like this did the same kind of thing. Uh, they also had demos like Suffering 2 demos on here and then they just have Mortal Kombat 2. So that's kind of cool. Let's go into the single player. They do have co-op and they also have a versus mode. Now, when you first start, you could pick either Liu Kang or Kung Lao and then they have other characters that you unlock as you go through the game. The best part about this game, which I think they'll let me do on here anyway, is that you still were able to do different fatalities, which was pretty cool. And I remember unlocking some too, if I remember right, but it was, it was pretty cool to be able to do that to different enemies as you built it up. Eventually you could legit just in the middle of the battle, just to have, for example, Kung Lao's hat just slice right through someone. And you still get experience to like build up characters and, and all this. It's just still a very good, fun experience. Like, I mean, I think you can sit down right now, play through this and just have an absolute blast. It's weird to me that they haven't done anything with this game. Although I'll admit, I'm not sure how this game sold when it came out. So that maybe it didn't do that well. And they figured, hey, you know what? It just, it didn't work. Let's, let's just go back to what we know and just do the fighting games. I think that's the part I like the most about this game is they took everyone's moves and kind of just adapted them to be more of a beat em up style. It felt really creative at the time because we just knew Mortal Kombat as this fighting game with crazy fatalities and stuff. But when they started incorporating uh, these different moves into like the, this large arena style with a friend playing through in co-op, it was just such a different feeling for the franchise. So I'm to the part now where you do the fatality. You basically have to build up that red meter at the top. And then when you get there, you press white on the, the white button. And then you got to actually put the combinations in. Just like that, uh, which is pretty cool because then you get a nice animation just like that. Not only splitting them in half, but also the monetization status on the video. But Shaolin Monks, massive recommendation for me. If anyone out there from Netherrealm or WB is watching, we want to see this remastered or remade 
for current platforms. Let's get that done. Look at the back. There's like a shoe print on it. I went ahead, it was kind of open from this side, but I went ahead and I just opened it because I, I, I wanted to see if the game was even in there or damaged or not. This, strangely enough, was part of a single order. And it was funny because it came with, it was supposed to be obviously a sleeve that didn't have the game in it. The game was actually sitting at the bottom of, of the entire envelope. So for some reason, I don't know what happened here, but it just came with one game from the entire order. But this is, this is uh, Touch My Katamari. I do like the Katamari games and I realized there was one on the Vita. So I said, hey, why don't I go ahead and uh, pick that guy up? Have not played this at all, but I do know that it uses kind of the back touchpad and everything. So I thought that'd be neat just to kind of use the different features that they have on the Vita. All right, so one package, one game seems excessive, but let's get into uh, this one here. This actually has a uh, list of different games. I'm actually gonna put that aside because it has more information on it as well. Let's take all of the stuff out here because none of this, none of this has a case. I know Vita games didn't really come with manuals at all anyway, but uh, this doesn't even have, these don't even have cases, it's all. And unfortunately, the one that I really wanted to have a case does not. So let's go through these. I'll show you which ones we have here as you guys were kinda, you guys were pointing out which ones to really grab. We have Persona, Persona 4 Golden. Uh, this is one that I did have and I did get rid of. And I did kind of regret it because I, I wanted to have Persona 4 Golden as it is like the game to get on the Vita. Everyone will say that. So I did pick this one up, but this one was more pricey. I think this one was $25. And as you can see, it is just the cartridge. I was hoping it would be the case at least. No dice though. So that's something to keep in mind for GameStop as we're starting to find out right now, as we go through some of these, there's a good chance that you're gonna just get the cartridge. You're not gonna get a case. So if you're looking to collect for the Vita, you might wanna maybe get away from GameStop a bit and start looking at some of the complete listings on places like eBay or Amazon. If you don't really mind though, technically you could take advantage of some of their deals when they do like buy two, get one on used. You can use your little rewards card and knock that down, which is what I did here. I took 10% off everything that they sent because it was all used. But that's when I would probably strike at GameStop is when they have buy two, get one free for their used stuff and then stack something like uh, your, your discount card on top of it. Because otherwise you're gonna be getting some fair fairly expensive cartridge only games. But I'm still excited to play Persona 4 Golden, so uh, at least I have the game. I'll just have to, I don't know, try to find a case or something for it. And uh, again, it doesn't stop there. I did get Hot Shots Golf. I wanted Hot Shots Golf because uh, I do like these games. Let me go ahead and zoom in a little bit so it's easier to see what's happening here. I did want Hot Shots Golf mostly because I, uh, I like playing these. I played it on the Vita a lot back in the day, all right? Uh, and Hot Shots Golf was really, really fun on there. And I mostly just wanted another golf game to play portably on that. So uh, that was that was an easy one because it was also only $5. So I figured, eh, five bucks, why not? I also grabbed an Ease game. I, I've not played Ease Memories of uh, Salsetta. I have not played this one yet. Uh, but again, Ease games, portably, great idea there. And of course, this could be a Vita game that might be harder to get down the road. No case though, that is another issue. In fact, none of these in here have cases and that does hurt. It is $19.99 as you can see, $17.99 after the discount, but still no casing on something like Ease. It, it is a game I have wanted to play. I've not played it yet. You guys recommended it, so I picked it up. Uh, I'll at least be trying it out and everything, but it is gonna be, I basically have to figure out a way to store these now. I need, I need to get a case for all of my cartridges, I guess, because I have no, I have no way of actually storing these without a case. So maybe I can find like a bulk lot of just Vita cases, like the just the standard blue cases online to at least store these on the bookshelf. Otherwise, these are really, these are smaller cartridges than the Switch even, and people lose those all the time. These would go missing. Also grabbed Wipeout. I wanted Wipeout uh, 2048, mostly because I like Wipeout. Wipeout is fun. I, I've played it a lot on the PlayStation 4, even in VR. That's like one of the games that I will actually hook up the PlayStation VR to play because it's so much fun and it's very crazy and fast and hectic. And on the smaller screen with the PlayStation Vita, this looks awesome. So absolutely I was gonna get Wipeout. Okay, this one is one that overwhelmingly outside of Persona 4 was recommended. A lot of people told me it was a graphical showcase, but it was still really, really fun to play. I had not played it. This is one I did not play because I got rid of my Vita earlier on, and that is Killzone. Killzone Mercenary is one that I wanted to play. This is supposed to really show what the Vita can do. It's almost like 
uh, if the Vita went on longer, we were gonna see visuals that, that really pushed it. This pushed it as much as it could for the amount of time that the Vita was developed for. And I wanted to check it out. It has online multiplayer. Don't know if the online multiplayer is still going on. If it is, that's gonna be really cool to check out. But I, I really wanted to grab this because of some of the screenshots and the video that was shown for it that I looked up the gameplay. This is one that would probably even look pretty good on the, uh, on the, PlayStation TV even up to like a bigger TV. So here's the good news. I think this one has some cases in it. So we've already gone through quite a few, uh, no cases yet, but this is larger. I can feel some cases in here. So we'll at least get something out of it. I'm curious though, which ones actually got cases because those are all ones I wanted to get cases. No Persona 4, that one hurts a bit, I'll admit. Uh, but let's see, these, none of these have cover art. <laughs> oh man, I am not, I'm not having a good time here, am I? Uh, no luck with GameStop, but at least their cases, I can store them, but man, all right, let's see. We have a couple here, let's go through them. So this one's just a blank case, and it has Freedom Wars. Okay, so Freedom Wars is absolutely a game that I played. This is one that I had, and I really liked it. In fact, from what I remember, we would even have regional battles between different parts of the world, like the US and Japan and everything. And I like this one quite a bit. Basically, you were in a prison and you had so much time that was on like your wrist. I had to go back and play it again. And uh, as you complete things, your time would go down. And the idea is to get that in years, I believe, down to zero so you can be free. And it was it was a really cool idea and concept. And it was almost like a when you got into like, like the fights and everything, it was more free flowing. And I really liked this game. So I, I was excited to pick it up again and play back through it. I think I stopped midway through and a lot of that had to do with the Vita just being ignored by Sony and it annoyed me and I didn't really see a future for the system, but I have it back now. No, 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 no manual obviously because they didn't really come with manuals, but no cover art. I have the case at least and technically I can print out some cover art, but it's still not necessarily complete. In fact, none of these are complete. This one is one that I didn't know anything about, okay? I, I thought I would go off some of your recommendations, just sight unseen, never played it before. This is Ragnarok Odyssey. It was only 10 bucks, it wasn't bad. Like some of the Vita games are cheap enough to where, okay, it's not complete, but you know what, it, it could be fun to try out. Ragnarok Odyssey is not a game I've played before. People were recommending it quite a bit, so I'll be interested to check uh, this one out as well. And because it's a lower priced one, I just kind of see it as a something good to pick up just to kind of even out the collection and just add more to it. So uh, not a bad not a bad grab there. And the last one I got, again, case with GameStop cover art on it, is, uh, is a good one. This is one that I did like playing quite a bit, and that is uh, Sly Cooper. Thieves in Time. I liked Sly Cooper series on the PS2, played it quite a bit. And when I saw that it was on the Vita, I believe they have a collection as well. That's not one I had, but I did have Sly Cooper Thieves in Time and I really did like it. So I'm excited to pick it up here and go start going back through it again. Um, and that'll be a good one as well. But I have a lot of the Vita games to play right now. And to be fair, they weren't badly priced. My only issue is they're not complete, but we can take a quick look at a rundown of all of the Vita games that I managed to grab at, I think fair enough prices compared to online. So there we go, these are all the games. We got Ragnarok, Odyssey, Sly Cooper, Thieves in Time, Ease, and we have Hot Shots, Golf, Killzone Mercenary, Persona 4, Golden, we have uh, Freedom Wars, yes, Freedom Wars, Wipeout, and then we have Touch My Katamari, and what was interesting was I double checked in the packaging, and they, they sent another copy of Wipeout for some reason. I only ordered one, but here's another case that has Wipeout in it. Still has the original box. That's right, this is the 80 gigabyte E01 PlayStation 3 console. And today, I guess we're gonna go ahead and unbox it. So if you guys enjoy the video, if it triggers any kind of nostalgia, any of that, make sure you hit the like button uh, down below. And think about this, in 2021 now, going up to this holiday, the PlayStation 3 will officially turn 15. It's been 15 years since the original PlayStation 3 launch. It doesn't feel like it's been that long at all. But this model here, when I saw it online, it looked like it was in great shape. And I just picked it up earlier today. So this is the first time I'm gonna take a look at it 
Also, I took a quick little look inside. It still has the styrofoam bag around the system, and I'm pretty excited to actually unbox one of these in, in 2021 now. So let's start by looking around the box. This is the MotorStorm bundle. So when it first came out, this would have been in August of 2007. Like I said, about 10 months after the PlayStation 3 released originally in November of 2006. Sony wanted to try to make the system a bit cheaper, at least that was what everyone was assuming at the time because they did remove the Emotion engine chip out of this PlayStation 3. They did bump it to the 80 gigabyte, however, which was 20 gigabytes more than the largest at the time being the 60 gigabyte model. And they packaged in MotorStorm, which came out alongside of the PS3 when it first launched. So at least packed in a game. And I think the idea was Sony wanted to phase out the 60 and the 20 so that they wouldn't have to keep packaging the Emotion Engine in with these systems and move on to software emulation. They still kept the graphic synthesizer in to, in the PS3 and they offloaded the Emotion Engine stuff into software with the cell processor kind of handling that. We can even see some of the games they were advertising at the time on the back of the box here with Lair. Oh, I remember that one. That, if I remember right, used the six axis quite a bit because you would use like the gyro motion to control your dragon kind of flying around. Heavenly Sword, Resistance, Warhawk, <laughs> Uncharted, and then MLB 07 in the show. They also have a little section here about the backwards compatibility. It says this product has limited backward compatibility with PlayStation and PlayStation 2 format software. Many PlayStation and PlayStation 2 format software titles operate, but full compatibility is not guaranteed. Updating the system software may improve compatibility. Visit PlayStation.com, all of that for system software. And from what I've seen, this works with like 90 to 94% is what people are saying online for the different PS2 titles. PS1 is pretty straightforward. That's just like software emulation. Still worked with the later PlayStation 3s, like your slim model, all this. But PS2 functionality ended with this model here. After this, they went to like the 40 and the, and the 80 gigabyte with the two USB ports on the front. They eliminated the memory card slots and all of that with the flap that would open up. And that was kind of it. But that's also when they started heavily lowering the price overall of the PlayStation 3. It was clear what Sony's strategy was there. They had to get this $600 price down fast. Oh, and check this out. CompUSA, October 10th, 2007. You remember those days with CompUSA? It's, it's been a while. All right, so let's see what condition this system's in. Like I said, when I saw it in the pictures, it looked like it was in fantastic shape, but remember, it's glossy on the top and we always get tons of scratches on that. So we'll see how the pictures turned out here when we actually see it in person. And like I said, I, when I took a look, it was still in kind of the styrofoam packaging here, the bag that they put around it. I think we even have instruction manuals down. We do. Also, real quick, did you know that in the manual for the PlayStation 3, they actually show you how to take the controller apart so that you can change out the battery inside. They point out, hey, you remove these screws here, you pop it off at the bottom, and then you can get to the battery if you need to replace it, or if you're recycling the controller, you don't wanna, I guess, throw it in the recycling bin with, with the battery in it. They also go heavily in depth with the specs of the system here. We had 256 XDR main RAM, 256 megabytes of GDDR3V RAM, 80 gigabyte hard drive, four USB 2.0 ports. Anyway, we do have, looks like a very large ethernet cable that they probably threw in there. I don't think that came with the PS3 at the time. HDMI cable, AV cables from Sony. And they did tell me that the six axis controller has a bit of an issue with the left stick here. It's kind of, kind of sticky a bit. And I, I'm actually willing to fix this this six axis controller. It's not the DualShock 3, but the, the six axis controllers from Sony that are legit are kind of hard to find because during the PlayStation 3's life, there was this run of very, very good lookalike PlayStation 3 controllers that were not first party and they were not from Sony and they flood eBay constantly. So it's really hard to tell which ones are legit and authentic from Sony. And this one absolutely is. This just came with the system itself here. So I'm actually willing to refurbish this controller a bit so that I can have an authentic one from Sony. And then we have the USB cable for the controller to charge and our power cable. All right, and finally, the PlayStation 3. So I'll admit, I'm very impressed that they have all of this stuff still here. The, the cardboard around it, the bag, uh, the bags for all of the accessories that came with it. All right, here we go, moment of truth. How does the PlayStation 3 look on the top where it's all glossy? Uh, You know what, that's, that's pretty good. That does not, I think a lot of this is, is just like, yeah. Wow, that's that is really good for like one of the the like the piano black type PS3s on top. That is in phenomenal shape actually. I have not looked yet. 
we're gonna see if the warranty sticker's still on it. Cause a lot of times these PS3 systems will get passed around so much and they'll be refurbished and all of this. Is the warranty sticker still on there? Ready? One, two, three, and it is. Look at that. That, yeah, that has not been tampered with. This PlayStation 3 80 gigabyte is in great shape has not been opened. So a quick tour of the PlayStation 3, this original 80 gigabyte model, if you're not familiar, it had four USB ports on the front. There's a hard drive indicator light, a wireless indicator light here, but then this opens up and we have all types of port. Look, we have one for a CF card. We have uh, SD, mini SD, the, the memory card pro that was from the PSP because you did have cross buy and all of that. You can move saves back and forth. And then on the front, we do have our, our disk drive slot here. And this is all chrome on the front. That's the biggest thing with this is that the top would get scratched, the chrome would get scratched. Everything was glossy all over this system and it just would not hold up well. You also have the little PlayStation symbol that will rotate depending on if you have it uh, in the horizontal or vertical orientation. Then we have some touch sensors, our power, and then our eject and a couple of lights here for either one. On the back, we have HDMI out, LAN, digital or optical out, AV multi out, our power switch, and then our AC in, and we can see CECHE01. That is the model directly after the A and B01 models that launched in the US. Now I do see some dust down here. This would have been uh, part of the, the intake where it's pulling air in through the front and all this, but like, the person I got it from definitely did not open it. You can only do so much to keep this clean. I expect dust all over it and even inside of it. Like I said, this is going on uh, 14 years old for this model in particular. Now they also gave me a ton of PlayStation 3 games with this when I bought it from them. I got the entire package, this PS3, the games on oh, the box, all of that for $150. And so far with the condition I'm seeing this system in, untampered with all that, this is pretty good so far. So nothing really crazy in terms of which PS3 titles are here. The basics, obviously MotorStorm's in there because it came with the system itself, but like Call of Duty's Battlefield. And I did at least have one PS2 title from them with Rebel Raiders. So they did a factory reset on it because I had to go through the initial setup very, very quickly here. And here we are now. And I didn't connect it to the internet because I'm just, I'm thinking, I just want to see what firmware it's on now to see if it's anything that's like super old. It is 4.87, so not really, no. It's not like 3.55 or anything uh, like that. And that would mean that like other OS would have been patched out by now, I believe, things like that. So unfortunately, no Linux out of the box for this one. But I guess we'll start with the game, which we'll start with MotorStorm, why not? We'll see if how that reads the Blu-ray disc. This, I don't think MotorStorm actually had to install anything. This is required hard drive space, 725 kilobytes. So it should just load right up. There it is, right away. This is this is pretty impressive. I'm thinking this is a system that maybe was played a bit or used as like a Blu-ray player primarily or something with some playtime, but then it got kind of put away maybe in, in like a closet or something for a while, just based on the condition of it here. It's, see, because back in the day, even if we just used the PS3 a little bit over time underneath the entertainment center, we would get uh, more and more dust falling on it, wiping it down and it would just get scratched up real bad. So the fact that the top glossy part here is in really good shape with I think just like one scratch here uh, tells me it wasn't used heavily. So I think the plan here is I'm gonna break the seal on the side and I'm just gonna clean it out in, inside of the system, put new compound on all of this. This is basically for me to, to have in the collection and use and all of this. So I don't mind doing all of that. Yeah, no problem with Blu-ray discs or playing PS3 titles here, running right through Motorsport storm no problem i think what i'm going to do now though is we'll check it with some ps2 games i haven't played motor storm in forever i just remember playing this a lot on release night i think for the ps3 when everyone was waiting in line because walmart had it as like part of a kiosk and i remember just playing this for a solid hour i would say over time of that night as we were just kind of all standing in line waiting for the ps3 to release next test we have a blue bottomed ps2 disc so that should tell us at least how the cd diode is inside of this PS3. Yeah, no problem with Crash Bandicoot at all. I do have one more disc to check. That's just a regular DVD PS2 game. This is a game that more people should at least try out, Digital Devil Saga. There, there were two of them. They came in like a, a, like a, like a pack you could get with a slip cover. It was really cool because your save data would carry over to the second one. It was a very dark RPG from Atlas. Uh, fits right in with the Persona series, uh, but definitely one people should try it. Looks like it boots up fine, no problems there. I was expecting that after the, the blue bottom PS2 game loaded up. Also though, this one is kind of on the more niche side, one that probably wasn't played as much on PS2s or PS3s like this. So I was kind of curious how it would, if it would actually work with this 80 gigabyte PS3, it appears that it does. All right, so now let's go ahead and 
open this PlayStation 3 up, change thermal compound, clean it up. It functions perfectly fine. I just figure we might as well do a little bit of maintenance to it since it is on the rarer side for the PlayStation 3 family. But first things first, let's remove this warranty sticker. It's gonna feel wrong, but it's, it's for good calls here. And there we have our Seagate 80 gigabyte PlayStation 3 hard drive. Actually, it's a Seagate, so that's kind of impressive. They might want to put this one on their website. Good, good testimonial here for their drives. And we have our security T10 that holds the top lid on, that slides over and then picks up. I'm gonna go ahead and put some of this styrofoam wrap around it since this is in such good shape for this part and then the top lid so it doesn't get scratched up or anything. They also have this metal bracket here where that screw, that T10 will screw into to hold the lid down. As after that, we just have Phillips head screws all the way around. Okay, all screws out. There's a tab up here you wanna press down and this will lift up and we're about to see how dusty this thing is. And wow, that's actually really good. <laughs> Usually what'll happen is because we have a power supply here and air will generally flow in through it and then out the back, I always see dust bunnies up here. There's usually dust bunnies here. There is some dust. It's not like it's like completely clean, but it uh, it's probably one of the cleanest, I will say, backwards compatible system. I mean, I'm really looking. Like there's some dust here, a little bit here. I mean, I wouldn't even have to like vacuum the system up. I would just like, I'll just be wiping it down with a cloth or something to get some of this, the, the basic dust down. And we have our Blu-ray drive here that just lifts up. Otherwise we have smaller screws all the way around our power supply, smaller screws around our Wi-Fi Bluetooth board here, and then our power button eject button here. With all the components off the top, we have screws around the outside with a few that are shaped or at least sized differently. This one, this one, and this guy in the back here. So most of them are the same. You just wanna make sure you remember where the smaller ones are so you don't actually take one of these larger screws and do something like jam it in here or even back here. You could actually damage the board doing that. And finally, I'm removing the brackets for the heat sink here. And now I can pick the whole thing up. And on the other side of this is where the large fan is. And that almost always is where dust will collect since that's where everything kind of shoots into it and then pushes right out the back. So here we go. Let's see how this looks. Uh, again, not bad. That's pretty solid. Like from what I'm used to when I would open these, even when they were like 10 years old, this is still pretty good. Yes, we have some dust down here where you can kind of see the outline of the fan spinning and then it creates like this circle pattern with some dust all around the bottom. Pretty straightforward. I was gonna wipe it down with it with a cloth. Just make sure it's nice and clean on the bottom here. And the fan itself doesn't even really look dirty. Some of the blades have some like residue from dust, but like a quick shot with some compressed air will probably clear this completely out. Here's the back of our board, and then we just want to carefully. I'm gonna lift this out of the heatsink because the chips could be mildly stuck. I feel like they won't be because I think the compound's gonna be pretty dry. And we should get a good look at our board. The compound. It's not dry, not completely dry. I mean, it is It is definitely uh, dried out a bit, but it still has some moisture to it, actually. It's not terrible. I think the biggest thing is that you can see the cell chip has kind of developed a, a bit of a, almost a window in the middle here. And a lot of times that is the chip that would cause the fan to speed up a lot because this chip would get really, really hot. So I think uh, just some compound being changed out here, we should be in pretty good shape. And I guess while we have this open, I could show you the graphic synthesizer that they did leave on this board in particular, but they did remove the Emotion Engine. Um, we looked at that with that 20 gigabyte system, but if we look here, this is our graphic synthesizer right here that they left on the board. We can see it runs to our RSX chip here and around and that of course bridges to the cell, but the graphic synthesizer that they have here is something they left in place so that they could still get PS2 emulation done well enough. I mean, like I said, about 94% of, uh, of games will work on this system based on what people have found through their own tests online and all of this. But they did remove the Emotion Engine chip, which we looked at before, and it had its own RAM as well. Basically, they just left a PS2 system completely on the 60 gigabyte and the 20 gigabyte system, and that did give the best overall compatibility. However, I have to imagine with Sony trying to trend downwards with the overall pricing with the PlayStation 3, they started to figure out what they could cut out, and that was one of the biggest things because for the most part, they've still had pretty good compatibility without the Emotion Engine chip in this PlayStation 3. Okay, so now everything's cleared off. These right here are pads from the heat sink. So like if I pick this up just as an example to show you, that's our large heat sink here with the copper pipes running around. This is for the cell, this is for the RSX. This actually is on a bit of a hinge, which is interesting, probably just in case the board bends or flexes or any of that. And then it runs down tons of different uh, blades down here for aluminum fins. And then this fan will just spin 
constantly to keep this thing uh, cool. And that's why you'll hear it kind of ramp up over time as you're playing games. This fan would get pretty loud to try to accommodate for both of these chips at the same time. But with this cleared off, we should be able to add some of our thermal compound on. The, the thing with this that was interesting is the way Sony set this up, because I did a lot of testing back in the day to the best method for applying thermal paste, Sony just expects this, this heat spreader to just be covered in thermal compound. I It's weird to me because for like the cell right here, the dye itself is like, a pretty small piece of this heat spreader. And when I would try to just get just that spot, the fan would go crazy. But then I would cover most of the area and it would be better. This, however, does have a die in the middle and then we have RAM chips on each corner. Because remember, they took RAM, left it over here for the cell on its own. So it has its own pool, 256 megabytes. And then the RSX has its own 256 megabyte cluster with four RAM chips in the corner here. So yes, this heat spreader also is designed to have compound and complete connection with this side here. So yes, you're gonna use a lot of thermal compound to make sure that there's good connection between these chips and the heatsink, which was really annoying at the time because that means these tubes of like MX4 Arctic Silver would be gone really, really quick. Also, it would completely go against what I would try to do, which is use smaller amounts of thermal paste because I knew that the chips wouldn't need as much with like the 360, right? You, you don't put much at all in there, but like these PS3s, they just soak it up completely. All right, so I closed it up, screwed it together with the brackets just to see how we were looking in terms of its connection with the board and that looks pretty good it, it it's still kind of light which is really funny because I feel like I put quite a bit on but like I said Sony will really challenge you with the with thermal paste and I know people get really annoyed when you put a lot of thermal paste on something but like work on a ps3 and you'll be shocked at how much thermal compound Sony expected you to use when you put these things together and with that new thermal compound cleaned out pretty well inside of any dust that was barely there anyway I guess there's nothing left to do but to put it back together and finish up. And ladies and gentlemen, that's going to do it here for the PlayStation 3 backwards compatible 80 gigabyte system. I have to say, this might be one of the best I've seen in a long, long time, considering its age in terms of overall condition. And it's also something to think about when it comes to the PS3's age in general, coming up on 15 years old at the end of this year. I guess it's a retro system now. That's that's how old we all are. Something I did order uh, earlier this year, actually. And it's not any games for the GameCube, but I saw it pop up on eBay and I thought it was a good thing to pick up as like a just in case or to fill in some of the parts of the collection that I was missing, which had to do with manuals. So this, believe it or not, is just a whole case of different manuals. And there are actually a lot in here. So we have manuals and cover art. That way, as you guys have seen here, I've already been getting games that don't have any uh, that don't have any manuals or cover art. They're just like disc only based games. So when I saw this, I figured, you know what? It was pretty cheap because it's just it's just cover art and actual full manuals here. I don't think anything in here is too like crazy or, or super valuable, but for trying to complete the collection and make sure it's solid, this is just a good way to at least have an out if I just find a disc only version of a game, maybe it's in a lot or something. And it even came with like all of the kind of the precautions booklets so that I can fill in as well to make sure everything's complete. Now you don't usually find manuals and cover art in this quantity all at once online. You can usually search for each one individually and just kind of cross your fingers and hope that someone has it listed for some reason. Maybe the disc they had is just bad and they realize that the cover art, the manual is valuable on its own. So I figured, hey, might as well grab this just in case down the road I need them. Now I did put in an order the other day. It's not going to be here probably before I would say even the end of the year, just based on how shipping time has been recently uh, with a slightly larger GameCube order with a system even. And uh, I wanted to still be able to do one of these before the end of the year. So I can't count on that being here, but I figure we'll have another update on the GameCube collection 
in January, maybe midway through there as I get more stuff, if I can find them, of course. This, however, I would consider to be more filler, although I am I am happy about one of the games that I grabbed here to actually start playing right away. The person actually did a pretty good job here wrapping this up, by the way, because while, like I said, these aren't super valuable games, I guess just overall, GameCube games are, are just becoming uh, very, very hot online right now to find. It doesn't even matter if it's more common stuff. It's all going up in, in value pretty quickly. So I did get NFL Blitz 2002, and I love the Blitz series, absolutely. Here's one that actually has everything with it though. So we have the manual, disc looks good, no scratches or anything. And this is the game I actually wanted to start playing right away because the NFL Blitz back in the day was awesome. And then we have Aggressive Inline and Dave Mira 2 Freestyle BMX. These games, from what I remember, were very similar to like what the Tony, they try to kind of capitalize on the Tony Hawk craze. I just remember seeing these occasionally when I'd be going through the different sections at like places like, oh, Blockbuster, there you go. Different rental places. I just remember seeing these pop up and uh, I never really got into them, but I figured, hey, I'm trying to collect the different GameCube games. I might as well check something like this out. And then Dave Mira, they had the demo back in the day on, I want to say it was the Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2 game they had on the PS1, I remember they had a demo and it was fun, but it wasn't as good as Tony Hawk Pro Skater um, at the time. Then we have Die Hard Vendetta, which for some reason has the sticker on the casing for Legacy of Cain, Blood Omen 2 at $12.99. That was like a GameStop sticker and they even have it on the back. So I don't know, I guess they just had the wrong casing for this one. I mean, this is what, I what was in the picture. So it's not like they had the wrong one. It's just, I guess there they had the wrong, they had the wrong casing on it. Hey, look, there's a Prima's official hint book. Eh, that's kind of cool. It comes with a hint book along with the manual. Wow, this looks like almost a full walkthrough that's with it because it has level one, has tips, objectives, images, uh, full text on what to do, it looks like. Yeah, that's not a bad way to kind of advertise it. Just give a like a little bit there for how you would be able to go through a level. And if people really like it, I guess they'd buy your strategy guide. Yeah, that's an interesting way to try to sell it. Then we have Extreme G Racing. This is a, a like a fast paced racing game that I remember playing at a friend's house a long, long time ago but I never had it myself. So this is another one I wanted to check out. Uh, looks like we have it at least complete with the manual. So five games total here, no nothing too crazy, but like I said, GameCube games in general are getting up there in price. And when you're trying to do the whole collection, you gotta get all of them and that will eventually include all of the different sports titles and everything. So you gotta go from the, the low end of the collection all the way up to the high end, you gotta get them all. So this is the order I put in with GameStop. They sent it in two different boxes because it's it's six games total. It was buy two, get one free, so buy two, get the third free. And once I realized that that was on all used games, which includes the retro section. So if you ever see that pop up on GameStop's website, a little bit of advice, go check out their retro section because most times that is included in that sale and if you buy three $50 games that are actually fairly rare, you get them with one of them being free. So instead of 150, it's $100. And I was trying to take advantage of that here. I got six games, but something's going on with GameStop and I, it might be because the pandemic and the situation now, they're getting less trade-ins. Their website is like cleared out, but they split them up into two different packages, mostly because I think one came from probably a different warehouse or something. So these are all cartridges and I thought it'd be interesting to see which ones they exactly send out. Uh, when it comes to the label, how it looks, uh, if it is authentic, that's another big one that people always question about this because we've heard stories about games coming out from GameStop and them being like reproductions or fake games, which I, sure, that could happen. It happens on eBay all the time too, so it wouldn't shock me. But first one I got was Super Mario, All-Stars, Super Mario World. I had, I still have Super Mario All-Stars, but not Super Mario All-Stars with Super Mario World. So I saw this on their site, surprisingly, and I was like, well, let's let's grab that one. And the label itself looks good, actually. There's no major like rips or tears or anything like that on it. There was a little bit of, I don't know if it was glue or whitening, because a lot of these places back in the day would put stickers directly on the label itself. And it's the most frustrating thing when you see that out in the wild. Now on the back, this is torn up pretty well. And I guess if it was gonna be one or the other, the front or the back to be torn up, I guess I'd rather have this back label ripped because you can replace this backing and generally you can find base, all the same information on other ones and it's a pretty easy change. You just kind of take these screws out, pop the back on. I actually don't have the driver here. I looked around, I thought I did. I think I have that at home. So when I get back, I'll also get some pictures of any of the boards here for these different Super Nintendo games and put them up on screen. Next, we have a game that I actually did not own and I remember wanting to get it back in the day and I just never got around to it. And that is Super Bomberman. This label looks a little more worn than the Super Mario All-Star Super Mario World. However, it is complete and not destroyed at all, so that's good. And then on the back, it's also 
not destroyed. And you know what's nice is these cartridges are not like yellowed really badly. Sometimes what you'll get is like one side will be gray and the other side will be like this really bad faded kind of yellow. Nope, these are gray all the way around. They don't appear to be uh, two different tones anyway. And then the third Super Nintendo game I did get is Kirby's Superstar eight games in one. I never owned this, I always rented it. I rented it probably like three or four times back in the day. And obviously, I mean, this is an awesome game to pick up. It looks really good. Like I said, on the back looks good. The label on the front, eh, looks it looks a little worn around the edge here, like where it kind of makes that right turn, right angle there with that sharp edge. But it's not ripped up, great news there. Yeah, this, this looks good. The pins look solid on the bottom. This does you. This one does use the extra pins on the outside. And uh, what I'll do is I'll also open this one up and get a picture of the inside of it. But these ones like this are actually a bit harder to reproduce because these extra pins on the outside. You very you definitely need uh, certain boards, I'll say, to make this one work. And while those are Super Nintendo games that I picked up there, and they don't necessarily fit in, I guess, with like the GameCube collecting right now. These do, and I've thought about it a bit more when it comes to getting Game Boy and Game Boy Advance games because of the Game Boy Advance player that I have on that GameCube right now, and I uh, have access to GBI, which is the Game Boy interface, better than what Nintendo has on that Game Boy disc uh, that you have to find for like 60 bucks or something. If you have access to like the homebrew side and you use GBI, much, much better. And I went ahead and grabbed a couple of Game Boy Advance games during the Black Friday weekend because I figured why not. And I did grab Fire Emblem, just the, the Fire Emblem on the Game Boy Advance. And I'm gonna explain why I grabbed this one. And I also grabbed Fire Emblem and the Sacred Stones. Now, you might be wondering why I got these ones in particular, because I will admit they are a little more expensive on uh, GameStop's site. Now, with the deals they had going on where they had percentages taken off of it, and I believe one of these was even free, it still was a little more expensive. Now, the reason I went through GameStop here is because if you go on eBay, what's interesting about this game Pokemon and Zelda Minish Cap, these games, for some reason, this group of games are, are the most like reproduced and bootleg games online. Like you'll go on eBay and it really is a toss up. Even be, even if the person isn't necessarily reproducing and selling them, they may have bought it as a reproduction and they think it's a real Fire Emblem or a real Pokemon game or any of that. There are some telltale signs you can look for like for the casing itself even, where it might be a little off, or if you just take a look at the board, usually you can tell, but it is a massive roll of the dice most times when you're going on eBay looking for this. I figure if I got it from GameStop, if it was uh, bootlegged, I could just return it without too much issue. However, I do have the tri-tip screwdriver here, so I can open these up and we can double check them. And a quick look at the boards, they do look authentic, completely legit here. Sometimes you'll see these third party, we'll say bootleg, cartridges that will have a battery, even though Game Boy Advance games technically don't need them. The reason Pokemon games like Sapphire, as an example, would use a battery is to keep the clock inside of the inside of the cartridge going. Whereas when they made the shift to Game Boy Advance, they had a flash memory here that did not require that typical battery that we have in Game Boy games and Super Nintendo games to keep the save data. So generally when you open these up, you can see like Nintendo's etchings on here. Uh, you can see that there's no battery, any of that. We have actual mask ROM here uh, that seem legit. So these, at this time, I'm gonna say that these are completely legit, which is good. And the boards themselves look to be in pretty good shape. I would say the Sacred Stones looks to be in better shape here, whereas the pins on this one could use a bit of a, a scrubbing, a little bit of a cleaning. But now that you take them apart, it's pretty easy to take this board out and just kind of scrub it up really well. No, 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 maybe I will look into Game Boy Advance collecting. It's just getting Game Boy Advance games with the cardboard box and the insert and, and the manuals, that's tough because those boxes, is basically just disintegrated over time. But just getting, the, I guess, just at least the cartridges would be pretty cool. These are very resilient. I found this on eBay and it looked like it was in pretty good shape, but it said in the description that it does not read any games. And I thought that was interesting because it's boxed. It actually has some of the stuff inside of the box that I was even looking for, which we'll take a look at soon. So I figured, hey, we could unbox it here. Should be a lot of fun doing that. And then we'll try to get it to work and have a fully complete working inbox Sega Dreamcast. First, let's start by taking a look around the box. And I do like this Dreamcast box. It's very dramatic looking with the Dreamcast controller here like this. And you have the horizon going across with like this little flare right there. But the, of course, the iconic swirl, Dreamcast, the ultimate gaming system. And if we flip it over, we can we can see one of the, uh, the most interesting description here at the top for a system. It says, congratulations, of course, big lettering there. 
Congratulations, Cupcake. You hold the future in your hands, not just the future of gaming, your booty's future. That's right, because Dreamcast's built-in 56K modem means you can play tons of Dreamcast games across the internet right now, and it's upgradable for DSL and broadband, of course. So just plug into any phone line, you're, in, you're on to millions of wonderful people, wonderful people, <laughs> across this great nation who want nothing more than to mop the floor with you. The awesome 128-bit graphics. We were still fresh off the bit war with the Nintendo 64 and the, we had the Jaguar and the, and the Super Nintendo Genesis, all that. We were moving away from it going into the generation with the PS2 and the GameCube and all that, but they still wanted to make sure that we did see 128-bit graphics. I mean, you can watch the, that happen in jaw-dropping detail, but sling not included. And we can see Sonic Adventure 2, Fantasy Star Online, Quake 3 Arena, NFL 2K1, Shenmue, and Crazy Taxi. So this should be this would be like a later uh, version of the Dreamcast than as Sonic Adventure 2 would have been out. So this wasn't expertly packed inside of the box itself. They did a good job packaging the system inside of another box with bubble wrap everywhere because while the box does have wearing around the corners, it's actually not in terrible shape based on how a lot of these cardboard boxes from like the late 90s and early 2000s ended up. Right away we have the Dreamcast itself still has the the clear plastic around it here. Let's see how this looks. It's it's in alright shape. It has uh, some scuffing around. I mean it is it is an all white system so it's gonna attract dirt and dust and all of this other stuff but for the most part it looks pretty good. The door pops right open so we'll have to run a quick test on this in a minute to see what's going on when it comes to reading games. We do have the modem, little modem here, so we can plug in and you play, I guess, Fantasy Star. I think Fantasy Star is still, actually, they have a version you can still play on your Dreamcast. Then we have all of our cables that are just kind of bundled up, just the AV cables and the power cord. And then we have our controller. The controller is also bagged up here, and while it is wound up, as it ended up being with the Dreamcast itself, because they kind of promoted that, even though I'm not a huge fan of winding the controller around. I mean, they kind of told people to do that just to get the cable to go around the, the top of it where you'd wind it down around. The reason I don't like that is because you end up with this, a lot of pressure on this bottom part here, and sometimes you'd actually have a broken connection that way. But that aside, the controller does look to be in pretty good shape. All the buttons press well. There's some scratching here across the center, but Everything else feels fine. And we also have all those little dots still in pretty good shape here. None of them have been rubbed off or anything from use. But that wasn't everything that you get when you bought a Dreamcast. You would actually get some pack-in games. Well, one in particular, the other was the web browser, 2.0 disc. And a lot of times, yes, it would still be sealed because there were quite a few people who just never used this. I mean, browsing the internet on the Dreamcast wasn't exactly great unless you had the keyboard. And even then it was like, it was okay, I guess. It was interesting because your console was browsing the web and it wasn't like your computer doing it, but this one is indeed still sealed, so uh, I guess we can pop it open real quick and open at least a piece of Dreamcast software for the first time. There's the web browser 2.0 disc. However, this is something I was really excited to see in the packaging. This is like a legendary demo disc for me. That when I got my Dreamcast, this is pretty much what I played constantly until I was finally able to save some money and, you know, buy a game for it. But check this out. If you bought a Dreamcast, you probably know all about this demo disc here. It was pretty good overall. Like it had Tomb Raider, you could play some of that. I remember playing MDK2. Uh, a lot of people played Sonic Adventure because this had the original level with the big whale that would uh, run and splash behind you. Dead or Alive 2, Tony Hawk Pro Skater, Legacy of Kane, Soul Reaver. There was quite a bit here just for a demo disc that came with it. A good way to get you started. And I don't know if this has really been used before. A lot of times this part would have been ripped off of here and it's kind of sitting in there. Now this looks really good. Not a scratch on it all. I don't, I don't think it's been used yet. Which should make it a good candidate to test the Dreamcast itself to see if it is having a hard time reading. Uh, to hook it up to the monitor, I'm gonna use one of these Hyperkin HDMI cables that I have laying around. I don't necessarily recommend these because they're not the best in terms of quality, but for what really what I need now, which is just to be able to get it up on an HDMI display for testing, it should be fine. So it starts right up and you have to go through and set the, the time itself. I'm not gonna do that completely right now because most times the battery inside has gone bad. I mean, it's an older system now, so you'd wanna go in and change that out. But anyway, we're to the menu now, so we'll pop the generator volume two disc in. 
and we'll see if it tries to read it. It doesn't sound good. I will say that it sounds like the laser itself is having a hard time maybe moving or seeing the disc as it is now. And it does not sound like it's gonna read, unfortunately. It still says, please wait while the disc is being checked. And it's just the laser keeps, sound like keeps resetting in the center as it's looking for the disc. You might be able to hear it, but it, it sounds pretty bad. I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and open this up. Yeah, please insert game disc. We're gonna open this up and see if the laser, is there any obvious issues with it? And if not, I, I think I might have this laser that we can change it out with to see if that fixes it. See, the nice thing about the Dreamcast, it really doesn't take much to get inside of it. I mean, the lid is held on by like four Phillips head screws, and then you can take a look at the laser immediately. All right, so here we are with our laser assembly here. Everything inside, you know what? looks extremely clean. Like, it's it's always weird to see a system that's struggling to do something like read a disc and then you open it up and it looks like it's barely been used. I mean, even the fan looks very, very clean right there. So, you know, the good news is we can start by taking this laser up, unscrew some of this, get the assembly out and see what's going on. So here's something interesting. I noticed I'm missing some screws. Like, there's no screws for this assembly holding it down. It just kind of it just lifts right up. There's generally supposed to be some screws, if I remember right, holding this down, but this one does not have that. So it does appear that someone at least opened it up to get to this point. So I don't know if somebody tried to fix it themselves or change it out at some point. I almost wonder if I can just take this assembly that I have, this one here, and just swap it. I don't know if the boards are married or anything like that. I guess I can just try it very quickly to see if that'll fix it. It's all one piece. You can see it slots in right down here at the bottom, plugging in there. And after that, I should be able to just test it and see if we get anything. Otherwise, I can move this laser assembly over to this board right here. All right, so we're back to the menu. Pop the disc down here, close it, and we'll see if it is able to read. Sounds like it's spinning up. Yep, and there it goes immediately. So I just happen to have that assembly laying around and I guess you can just change these out without too much issue for that. Uh, I'm assuming that whoever had this originally, it wasn't reading, maybe they opened it up to check it out because it is missing a couple of screws, which would also explain why it was so clean inside. Maybe they decided, oh, we'll try cleaning it to see if that would fix it. But either way, change the assembly out with the laser itself. And here we are now with the Dreamcast sampler disc. I mean, just look at how ridiculous this demo disc was. And remember, this came with the system. So if you weren't, if you were a little younger maybe, and you didn't, you know, go out and buy all these games, this was such a cool thing to get with it. Cause like Sonic Adventure, Tomb Raider, the Last Revelation, Fur Fighters, Railroad Tycoon 2, MDK 2, Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1, Rayman 2, Dead or Alive 2. There's a lot of good stuff here. So here, for example, is Tony Hawk Pro Skater. And what happens with this is you just press start, you go through and it immediately throws you into the warehouse level where you can play through as Tony Hawk for a couple of minutes. And you can just do that over and over again. I remember playing this one several times on the Dreamcast. It is very difficult to see from here, actually. Uh, but I remember playing through this several times. This demo disc is mostly what I used at the time to play my Dreamcast, just because I didn't really have a lot uh, to play when I first got it for Christmas. I remember Christmas Day, you had what you had. And I remember I didn't really get any games with it. So I just played this demo disc all of Christmas Day and then the next, and I believe like two or three days later, I finally was able to go out to the store and buy an actual Dreamcast game. This may have been the most mind blowing demo though, the Sonic Adventure trial version, because you don't have any of the beginning part where you have to go through like the, like the opening story section. It just throws you into Emerald Coast immediately. So at the time coming from the Nintendo 64 or the PS1, and then you go to this where you're running away from the, like the huge whale and the bridge is collapsing. It was super impressive then. I mean, it still looks pretty good now, especially if you're running through like the DC HDMI, the, the Dreamcast board that does HDMI out at 1080p. It still looks very, very sharp now with the Dreamcast visuals, the way it worked. But at the time, I was just absolutely blown away by how this game looked compared to everything else around it. Even when the, even when the PS2 came out, you know what? I was still pretty impressed by the Dreamcast itself because I remember the Dreamcast still just looking sharper than what we had with the PS2 at the time. The PS2 still looked pretty soft in comparison to the Dreamcast. And it wasn't until like maybe two years into the PS2's life that it really started to separate itself from the Dreamcast. And by then the Dreamcast was 
pretty much done anyway. Sega really ran into a lot of issues with that system as the PS2 went along. Um, but like you see this and think about this in like 1999 and it's just way above anything else. Let's just actually go right to that sealed game because I, I really want to open it to see. It is, uh, it's actually Tony Hawk Pro Skater American Wasteland and I've been on a Tony Hawk Pro Skater kick recently. Tony Hawk Pro, or Tony Hawk trended on Twitter and I started playing them. I even played Tony Hawk Pro Skater 5, which is like a, like a terrible idea at this point, right? It's not good. It's not a good game. But uh, I still went ahead and, and played it, and I played pretty much all of them. I spent most of my time on Underground, though, on the GameCube, because that, that is still a really, really fun game. But let's actually go ahead and open this guy up real quick. I do have... Uh, just a little screwdriver here to cut it open real fast. I don't know if it was resealed. That was my thought initially was, oh, they just resealed it. No, this is, from what I remember, how it would be sealed straight off of the, uh, off of the store shelf. There we go. And it is the player's choice one. I, I'm not the biggest fan of player's choice, and a lot of people realize it's probably because it has, like, like the yellow that does not go well with the on the shelf when you have them all spined, you know, next to each other. This does not fit in. It kind of breaks up the the kind of the uniform look across the the spines. Player choice, of course, American Wasteland. Case is in excellent shape as you'd expect. It is brand new. Uh, and there we go. Oh, look at that. Everything looks that yeah, looks perfect. Just how I would expect a brand new game to look. It is really funny that I just see it on Amazon, brand new randomly. So I did just open a sealed GameCube game. I know that's probably not the great, I mean, I'm going to play this anyway. It's probably not the greatest idea now with how GameCube games are shooting up in price, but this was $20 brand new. And I really wanted to play American Wasteland anyway. So I don't mind opening it. And of course that means because it was brand new, I was going to get everything, the manual as well. Yes. Manuals. I know a weird thing in 2020 games used to come with them. Okay. Let's move over to one of the rare games. I guess that I picked up. Uh, I did grab cause I have to start getting them eventually. And I gotta tell you, some of these GameCube games are really jumping in price. I had to start picking up the Mario party games, right? Like it's Mario party seven right here. I have to start getting them. And I played, you'll have to let me know which Mario Party game you played the most. Cause I, if you had a GameCube, you had a Mario Party game. There was four, five, six, and seven. Eight was on the Wii. And then before that three was on the Nintendo 64. So we did actually get a pretty good selection. I liked four the most. Four was my favorite one, but this is seven. And seven did have uh, the microphone that it used, but I don't think it used it as much as six. I think six is was one I really didn't like because they really wanted you to use that microphone. Uh, but I do know seven used it somewhat as well. It even says on the back, back here that the microphone returns. Like it's like, it's a big deal. It's, uh, I, I wasn't a fan. Four was my favorite one. I thought four was still kind of that traditional Mario party without having to use anything like a microphone. I think five was similar, but for some reason four was, four was it. But man, this is, the Mario Party games on the GameCube are getting very, very expensive now to get complete. Like you're looking $50, $60 per, sometimes more than that. And uh, getting the microphone, microphone's like not even, that's like five to $10 shipped or something. That's the cheap part. It's getting this game in uh, what I have to say is excellent condition. The the uh, the person who actually put this together and shipped it on eBay did a very good job shipping it. It's in very good shape. So I at least have one of the Mario Party so far, but I still need to get four, five, and six. And that's four is more expensive than I thought it would be. I thought getting up to like seven would have got a bit more expensive. No, four, it, that costs some money. So that's probably the next one I'll get because that's when I remember the most. But I wanted to get one that I was less familiar with from back in the day, just so I could maybe get a newer new to me anyway, experience for Mario Party. So picked up seven. So this next one I actually grabbed because when we were doing the podcast, after we were done the podcast, Scott was bringing it up. Scott the Waz kept bringing it up. Eternal Darkness, he had just picked it up and he was talking about it. And I said, you know what? I rented Eternal Darkness back during like the GameCube's like heyday when if you walked into a Blockbuster or something, they were like, you had a whole section, right? Of GameCube games to rent. I remember I rented it for a weekend and I didn't play it as much as I would have liked to have at the time. And then I never rented it again because back then we would rent a game like five or six weekends if it was longer RPG just to beat it. Uh, and, and because we had our memory cards, of course, we didn't have to hope that the save game was still on that same cartridge. No, we, we had our save games with us. So much better than the Super Nintendo days where we had to hope. Although with Mega Man X3, I had a password that I could just punch in. Anyway, uh, Eternal Darkness. This is 
This is a game that I've wanted to play through for a while. And when we got those rumors coming up that they were that it was getting trademarked and oh, maybe they'll do something with it. I got excited with the idea that they might take this one and move it over because I didn't get a chance to dive into it as much as I would like to. But now I have it here. Uh, looks to be in very good shape. This is another GameCube game that is jumping in price very, very quickly. I remember like a year or two ago, it was like 18, $19. And now it's up to like the forties and fifties complete. So I think right now GameCube games in general are just getting very, very expensive. It's like the next thing that's starting to jump after the Nintendo 64 did. It's now like all GameCube stuff is getting crazy. But I did hear that this is kind of like the, like the GameCube's version of, of a Silent Hill. It kind of has that weird horror to it that messes with you, I guess, with like breaking the fourth wall at times. So I'm excited to check this one out. I have a few other rare games, including the one you guys, everyone told me to buy, but I figured we go through some commons real quick so you can see some of the commons I picked up. Uh, I did grab Call of Duty Finest Hour, and I also grabbed Call of Duty 2 Big Red 1. Now, Finest Hour, was actually a game that I liked back in the day. And what's really funny is this is when Call of Duty had no multiplayer to it. These aren't expensive games. I actually got these locally at a store around here uh, and it was like $5 for each one. So it, they're not super expensive. I think I'm missing the manual, unfortunately, for Finest Hour. And uh, I do have it for Big Red 1, but I did like Finest Hour back, back in the day. It was strange now to look back on it to think of a uh, Call of Duty that there was like zero multiplayer to it. It was just all one campaign, but that's how it was back then uh, for some of these Call of Duties. They'd come out and they had didn't really get into the multiplayer aspect like they do now where, you know, they're shipping Black Ops 4 with no campaign, really. I'm sorry, campaigns baked into every part of it. No, 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 this was like, this was like campaign focused back then. This was, a lot of people think is the golden age of gaming and that's, that's because we didn't have a lot of the microtransactions and always online stuff. We just had straight up experiences like these that were just single player. So it was pretty cool because, because they focused on it so much, they had some fun set pieces. These were kind of limited by the hardware at the time with the GameCube and the Xbox and the PS2 or any of that, but I still really liked them back in the day. And it was again, Activision when Activision was really good. I also picked up Cell Damage and I wanted to kind of point this one out real quick. This game has actually made it to a ton of different platforms now. It's, uh, it's on PS4, Xbox One, the Switch fairly recently, the Vita, the PS3. It's been moved all over the place and this is an EA Games published game. I think uh, Pseudo, I think, did this one alongside of them. This one was a little more expensive at that store at $9.75. However, a lot of times I will buy a lot of these GameCube games from them when there is like a discount going on or something or a sale. So it's like, they're usually like 20% off or something. But this was a game that I thought looked so cool back in the day because it has like this cell shaded style, like cartoon visuals. And it was called Vehicular Combat back then. So it was kind of like Mario Kart's battle mode, but you had like axes and like dynamite and all kinds of stuff. And it was, it was really, really funny the way they had it set up, but I wanted to really play it myself here. And again, this was when EA was not the EA we know now. This was when it was like EA games challenge everything. Do you remember that? Right? Uh, that feels like that was an eternity ago. And it really wasn't that long ago, but it, it does. It feels like it was a full lifetime ago with how we know EA now. I also grabbed Need for Speed Underground 2. The reason for that is because the disc that I have for Need for Speed Underground 2 started to kind of skip and get the uh, doesn't is not reading logo that would pop up. You know, it'd say, oh, uh, check the disc. There's an error or something. So I went ahead and just grabbed another copy here. Uh, it, it was like $8, so it wasn't too expensive. And it is complete. The one that I had was disc only before this. So this, uh, this wasn't bad. I love Need for Speed Underground 2. Uh, so I had no problem picking this one up for that for that price. And the fact that it was complete, whereas before I just had the disc, not bad. Again, this is when Need for Speed was really good. And I think that might be why I like Need for Speed Heat so much because it reminds me of this game. Simpler time, right? When we had EA games making, uh, well, Need for Speeds like this. Heat is very similar actually to this and the original Most Wanted. And finally for the commons, I also grabbed Metal Arms. Uh, the reason I grabbed Metal Arms, I have never actually played it, it's Glitch in the System. Now, Metal Arms Glitch in the System is a game that I really remember from my days at GameStop way back when, which is really funny because it actually has a GameStop sticker on it right here for $4. It was a little more than $4 of the store I picked it up. I think it was like 12 or 13, but this is a complete copy of it, which is great. Uh, the box isn't in the best shape, but I guess I can, 
technically get a new new uh, new case for it. The real annoyance is that back then GameStop would actually put the sticker on the cover art. So that is like almost a surgical procedure, you know, to get that off without ripping the cover art. I wish GameStop did not do that, but they felt the need to for whatever reason. Uh, this is actually a game that whenever I would go through and file, because this was back when we still had Xbox and GameCube games and PS2 games back at the GameStop. Whenever I'd file, I remember I'd get to the edge, it would be M, and this was at the end, and I would always see it whenever I'd have to go through. And I remember I always thought to myself, I should take that game out, because they let us like take games home and play them. So I should take that game home and play it one time. It was on the original Xbox, I believe, and I never did. But I went ahead and grabbed it. It looked like it would be a fun little game to try out. It does have four player simultaneous multiplayer and it supports progressive scan. So it could be a lot of fun. Uh, we'll see about this one. Now I have one other game outside of this one, but this is the one that you guys kept telling me to pick up. It was pretty hard to get, I think reasonably. Uh, that is Skies of Arcadia. Every time I did a GameCube update video on the collection games I was picking up, Skies of Arcadia was in the comments like 80 different times and it was upvoted like crazy. Get Skies of Arcadia Legends, it's an awesome game. I did have this back in the day and I really, really liked it. But, you know, me being the dumb kid I was, traded it in because, you know, the new system's coming, the 360 or, or something else at the time. But I remember trading in all of my GameCube stuff to get the new system and this was one of them. This game is becoming very, very expensive. Now, I did get, I, I've already made, I think, the commitment now to collect GameCube games, so it's not as bad as get when I got Gotcha Force, but this game is getting right around $100 at this point, so it is very, very pricey to pick this guy up. This one is complete, and I do get nervous buying these more expensive ones on eBay, mostly because you don't really know what it's gonna come in condition-wise, but this one, fortunately, showed up in I would say the disc is almost in mint condition, just about no scratches at all on the bottom. And the manual has very, very little damage. I think there's like a little crease down here, nothing major. For me, it's not a big deal because I wanted to pick this back up so I could play back through it. I just like this because this is when, this is when Sega was uh, going away for being a console manufacturer with the Dreamcast. So they started moving all of their games to other platforms. This was when that happened. So you had like Panzer Dragoon and, uh, and Jet, uh, Jet Set Radio Future on the original Xbox, and like the GameCube was starting to pile up with 3D Sonic games, and it also got Skies of Arcadia Legends, so it was pretty cool to see that happen. Well, it was a shame to see Sega start to kind of back away from the console market, because the Dreamcast was so awesome, and I would have liked to have seen what Sega could have done with a follow-up to that. But on the other hand, we also got things like Skies of Arcadia Legends on the GameCube, so it actually kind of worked out. And the last game, uh, it's nothing too crazy, but I have to at least give the uh, the person credit who wrapped it up, because they wrapped it twice there. Uh, that is, uh, and I don't even know how to really pronounce this as much, it's uh, Botan Kaitos. It's, uh, it's a game that I remember, oh, look at that, they put bubble wrap inside. Oh, that's nice. See, that's a good, that's how you package these games. Good job with the packaging, whoever sold this to me on eBay. Uh, but this is one of those games where it had two discs, of course, and this was a strange one. I, I've played this a couple of times, but I really never picked it up. I think this is one I rented back in the day, and I did not like it because when I saw the front, I was not expecting it to play the way it did, which was kind of... It was kind of strange if I remember right. Like if I look at the manual, it was, it wasn't like a, like a straight up RPG, like a JRPG, it wasn't like an action RPG. It had like cards almost. It, it was, it was strange. It was like the, yeah, right here, they have the deck. Displays the current number of Magnus included in the deck out of the maximum amount of Magnus that can be held in the deck. But that was when I was younger, now I'm a bit older and I figure might be worth checking this one out and seeing if it's any different from what I remember from back then. This is another one we've heard some rumors and trademarks and stuff about it possibly returning in some way. And I think the producer and other developers have said they'd like to, but I don't know if that will ever happen. This is Namco, so we'll, we'll see about that one. But I will give it another look now that I'm a bit older and I've gone through way more RPGs now than you know back then. This is the ultimate home console seller. So today I wanted to take a look at it. I actually managed to get one boxed up here. I got it at a convention last year because I thought it'd be really fun to unbox an original PS2. Still has uh, the manual and some other things in there, so we'll go over that. And then of course, we'll take it apart as well. Also, if you guys enjoy seeing some of these older systems in the box, 
uh, kind of unbox, taken apart, let me know down below and leave a like if you enjoy it because then I can you know, try to track down some other older systems boxed up and we can check them out here. You know, I actually like the blue, like it's, it's a very simplistic look, right? It's this all blue box with just PS2 and PlayStation 2 in the middle. And I think that works better than even just having the system pictured on the front, which is what we've seen before, right? Where they just have a picture of the system. Think of like the PS3 where they were doing that uh, later on. I wanna look at the back because whenever we get these systems and you look at the back, they, of course, always have like example games. I like to see kind of what they were advertising. Let's see, they have Sly Cooper. That's a good one. Dark Cloud 2. Dark Cloud 1, I mean, Dark Cloud 2 is good, but do you remember Dark Cloud? They had that in magazines and they were like, this is the ultimate, this is the Zelda killer. And now no one really talks about Dark Cloud 1 like ever anymore. There's 989 Sports NFL Game Day. That was before, you know, we just had one game now, Madden or 989 Sports NBA Shootout. It's Tekken 4, Tomb Raider, Angel of Darkness. We can just kind of forget about that one. And once again, they have a massive lineup of accessories. The PS2 was no stranger for accessories. They have like the vertical stand. If you want to stand it up, it just makes it a bit more sturdy. Uh, horizontal stand as well. I, I did not have that one. I had the vertical stand. I did not have that though, the, the horizontal stand. And then the mouse, something else I did not have. All right, so let's open this guy up. Now, when I did get it, they said that they had just thrown like a controller in here along with uh, cables. So it, these weren't exactly wrapped up very well, uh, but everything that I need is there. Then we start to get into some of the more interesting things that did come with the system, which includes, and I'm not even kidding, look at this thing. Look at this manual. This is massive. I mean, seriously, this is a huge manual. Now it does have English, French, and Spanish. So they have several different languages here, but this is ridiculous. They have pictures, which is really funny. They even have like little, kind of like little cartoons where it's like, hey, don't don't put it in the bathtub. So, you know, glad they, glad they have a cartoon to illustrate that one for me. Uh, there's another one here about ventilation where it's like, don't put it on your couch. All right. Got, got that one. They also have a section here that's all about outdoor antenna grounding, which is not exactly something I'd expect to find in the PS2 manual, but I, I will give Sony credit. There is a lot of detail on how to use this system uh, in here. I was looking to see if they ever had any instance where they called the X button cross or anything like that, but it seems like they just pretty much always used the symbol that was on the controller. It's like they also have a full ESRB guide for what all the symbols mean, I guess for any parents that would check it out. This appears to be for they introduced the E10 Plus. And it looks like I also have an advertisement here for PlayStation Underground. That, okay, that's pretty cool. Did anyone else have PlayStation Underground? I had some demo discs from them, but I know they did a ton of demo discs. So let me know if you still have any of those laying around. All right, there we go. We got the system out here with the styrofoam. System looks to be in pretty good shape overall. We'll get the, those guys off of there and take a look at it. Got styrofoam all over this thing. So looking at it, it, it looks like it's in pretty good shape overall. It has some scratching here, but like on the front where these vents are, usually if I see a used PS2 that like was in a, a I'll say on the carpet or something, this is always clogged up with like dust or dirt. It looks pretty clear right here, I, I gotta say. And the warranty sticker is still intact, which we're about to break anyway. And then the, even the expansion bay door is on there where you put like uh, one of the larger hard drives. You know, there was a tweet uh, pretty recently from the PlayStation account on Twitter that mentioned that the front symbol can be turned based on the orientation you have for your system, whether it's vertical standing or horizontal, you can actually take this symbol and you can turn it. And that is correct. Now, I thought that was something that was known, like I thought a lot of people knew that, like it was widespread, but I guess not. Yes, you can turn the little symbol on the front depending on which way you have your PlayStation sitting. Now on the front of the PS2, we have our eject button, power and reset button there. You press and hold to turn it off, tap it to turn it on. It has two memory card slots, controller ports here, two USBs, and interestingly enough, a Firewire port. And while most of us call it Firewire, that's technically not correct. See, Firewire is what Apple calls the IEEE -E -E. 1394 serial bus connection, whereas Sony calls it the iLink. And you might be wondering what it was ever used for because to be honest, I don't really know anyone who used this. See, the idea here is that you could connect multiple PlayStation 2s together, kind of like system link that we would use now with crossover cables or ethernet cables to some sort of router and then play local multiplayer. Kind of also reminds me of a system link that we would do between 
Game Boys, and that's pretty much what it was, stacking some PS2s or having them close enough to where a cable of six to eight feet could connect, and then you could play some games. It wasn't a lot. In fact, the list is, I think, 10 to 15 games, and you have games like Armored Core, Gran Turismo 3, Time Crisis, those were the games you could play. It was a cool idea, I guess, but no one really used it. And eventually Sony just started making cases in the factory that just covered up that port completely. So even they knew that, well, no one's really using it. It's not even worth cutting out a hole in the plastic for. Now on the back, we do have our power port here, digital out, optical port, which was nice to have, AV multi out, and then we have our power on off rocker. This threw some people off since the GameCube didn't have it and the original Xbox did not have something like this and that would just turn it on and off. This is the thing that people would call over the phone for like the PS3 and be like, it doesn't turn on, what do I do? And I would have to let them know, you have to turn the main power switch on. Now we also have this expansion bay, which if you open it up, it has a slot for a hard drive. And we would have uh, hard drives for like Final Fantasy uh, 11, for example, that you would slide in here. And they even had one that would come with Final Fantasy 11. I think it was a 40 gigabyte IDE drive. Now, of course, later on in the system's life, people have hacked it and everything, and you could put hard drives in there, rip games to it, all of that. But for the most part, I remember using that for something like an MMO of Final Fantasy. So I had repaired some PS2 twos, but for the most part, I got into the repair scene after the PS2 had kind of run its course and the PS3 and the 360, of course, were out, but I would still see them come in on trade-in where they wouldn't work or sometimes, yes, people would just want their PS2 to be fixed. I, I'm not, I'm not kidding. It would happen. And a lot of that had to do, of course, with them saying, I don't want to buy a used one. I just want to put a new part in mine because I know I took care of mine. Uh, that makes sense. So I have worked on some of them, but not as much as like an Xbox 360 or the PS3 at the time. But usually the things I would work on with the PS2, it just wouldn't read games. That, that always seemed to be the problem. Like very rarely did I find one that was overheating, which it does need a fan. So it's possible that like the fan could just stop working and then boom, the system overheats. But for the most part, it was, it wouldn't read like the blue bottom disc, right? It wouldn't read that or it wouldn't read DVDs or it wouldn't read PS1 games. Those were always the things. And a lot of times you would just change out the laser. All right. So with all the screws out, warranty sticker on the back cut so we can open it up. That guy will pop open. We do have a cable running from, uh, from the front button boards here. There we go, we can get that guy out of the way. And that does all separate. So like I have dust in here, I can pretty much just take this and for the most part use just basic soap and water to clean this up really well. You can even remove the memory card mechanism part right here with the springs if you wanna just take that out and clean that separately also. So it's pretty straightforward to clean this guy up and make it look new. Now we do have our power switch back here that then runs down and around, but that actually just pops right out. A Couple of uh, Phillips head screws for the memory card slots here that actually runs to the main board here with a cable. Now after grabbing any of the Phillips head screws around the perimeter up here, especially around the fan, this guy will just kind of pick right up out of there and we can put this bottom piece to the side. Another easy thing to clean. Again, there's no like electronics or anything here. You can just kind of drop it in some water, scrub it up real well with a soft bristle brush like this one. Now we're gonna flip it around. I would always get annoyed when we had systems like these back in the day because the, uh, the Xbox One is kind of like this where you have to then flip it around uh, to see the exposed board down here to get to more screws. And we can see a large hard drive bay here as well that they had to build in of course for that three and a half inch drive. But we can start removing these screws and then finally we should be able to get to the motherboard. So this is our power supply that I just unscrewed. You can see it's very much exposed by the way. Uh, I think it was with a PS2 Slim when I first opened it. I remember opening it and touching it and it gave me a jolt. So these weren't exactly insulated super well, but that is our entire power supply for the fat PS2 model. And you can see this guy just kind of runs down there and pretty much cuts the, cuts the circuit or leaves it uh, pretty much connected. So we can put that guy to the side. But yeah, that's, if they don't power on at all, generally it's something on here that has to be replaced. Anyway, our hard drive cage also just lifts up now as well. So we're good there. And we're, you can see we're getting closer and closer to the motherboard. We also have our fan here. This is of course where a lot of dust kind of gathers, but this is also the big noise maker in the PS2. I, I don't know if they ever came out with any kind of aftermarket fans or if there is a modification to install a quieter fan but this fan was 
kind of loud. Like if you have a PS2 now and you power it on like one of these fat models, you know what I'm talking about. Y you hear it pretty much right away. So that's actually a modification I wouldn't mind looking into, especially as we start to get like HDMI mods for the original PS2 systems. I wouldn't mind seeing if I can get a better fan as well. All right, after wrestling a few clips down here free, the fairly large skeleton part comes off. This of course keeps the board from flexing and works to uh, keep any heat off of chips that it can because there is still some chips on the bottom here, but it's pretty solid. Like this is not like cheap, uh, flexible metal. So the good news is the memory card slots and the uh, controller ports up here, like I said, are just on a cable. So if one breaks off, which I have seen that, I've seen the controller ports break off, like people kind of rip the cord out sideways, same with the memory card slots, you can actually replace it fairly easily. It just, it's its own part. You just gotta look it up and order it online. So that's not too bad. Same with the button board, that is also modular. You can see that here. I've seen the power buttons get jammed in and then it's like, oh great, what do I do now, right? One thing I was not a fan of, by the way, with this design is that the cables from the drive run around the side and plug in, which made it kind of a pain to replace the drive if you had to. Like all these cables I'm unplugging right now, are literally for the disc drive on the other side. Usually you'd be able to access that without too much issue, but unfortunately, for whatever reason, Sony decided to go this route. So first thing to look at here is the fairly large heatsink, I would say, on the top here. Now, they, the way this worked, they had the fan, of course, in the back, and it just used the entire system as kind of a shroud to pull air and just push it out the back. That was the idea. Whereas we got into like the 360 era and they had to get a little smaller with the shroud to get a better uh, bit of cooling and suction out of the back. But for the most part with the heat, these chips, these two chips here generated, it was fine and it, and it worked well enough. But let's take a look at the two chips here. This appears to be a slightly newer generation of the PS2 because otherwise this chip is the same color and size as the Emotion Engine chip right here. So let's get a good look at our chips right now. We have the Emotion Engine chip here, and then we can see the RAM chips off to the top. So it's pretty easy for our CPU, which is this guy, to access that. This is the same chip. And remember, we also had that, that same kind of RAM that was in the 20 gigabyte PS3 that we had opened up pretty recently. Right here to this chip's right is our graphics synthesizer. By the way, I love that name for what's their GPU. I, I think that's a really cool name for it. Graphics synthesizer. And it would of course fill up all those sweet polygons on screen. Now at the time, the PS2 was technically seen as the weakest system out of the three, being the GameCube and the Xbox, then the PS2. Now the Xbox was pretty much the most powerful system at the time during this generation, but the PS2 was able to do quite a bit of stuff. It of course had the advantage over the GameCube in terms of getting DVDs, which we're going to look at that drive in a second here as basically its biggest advantage. But even so, the Emotion Engine chip and the graphic synthesizer did some really cool stuff at the time. You can look at games like Metal Gear Solid 3 as an example, or even Killzone. I mean, this thing was even pushing 1080i, I believe, with certain games like Gran Turismo 4. That game looked really, really good for a PS2 generation game. Also during this generation, we had a lot of games that pushed higher frame rates. 60 frames was, I think, more common here than it was even in the following generation. I mean, there were a lot of platformers at the time that really just had much smoother looking gameplay overall because of it. Oh, also uh, one other thing while we're looking at the board, if your PS2 just stops keeping like the, the date and time and all of that, this battery needs to be replaced. They're pretty straightforward. This is a CR2032. On some of the later model PS2s, they have them actually on the side of the disc drive, which is a strange location. This just being on the motherboard makes more sense. Now let's take a look at what gave the PS2 its biggest advantage. That is the disc drive. The fact that the PS2 could play DVDs in 2000 was a really big deal. DVDs were just taking off. And the fact that the PS2 was like the same price as most DVD players, a lot of people just bought a PS2. Now the PS2, I'll say wasn't the best DVD player. It was missing a lot of features that those standalone boxes were, but the fact that it could play PS2 games, PS1 games, and DVDs was a massive selling point. But that was also uh, a point of the system that was probably the weakest in terms of it breaking. This drive, I, this thing was so delicate. <laughs> I, I don't understand it. It just, whenever it would come in, it was because there was a problem with this disc drive. Now, I assume they had to, uh, to cheap out somewhere. And because of how expensive DVD systems were at the time, 
I feel like it was probably here, like this is where they had to, but still it was so common for these things to come in and this disk drive to just stop working. Here's our laser right here, by the way, right in the middle, capable of course reading CV CDs, DVDs, and I believe, believe later on, it was also able to read DVD RWs as well, so rewritables, which was good. But there are so many times that and ways that people would work to try to fix these disk drives that it would get kind of crazy at times. Like there was a point where people would use this back piece here to spin it, to kind of raise and kind of lift up the uh, the tray itself. Of course, you can also play around with the potentiometers that are on this laser dry, this laser here so that it would put out more power and be able to read better, but that would at times kind of lower the overall lifespan of that laser. It was, it was all over the place. And replacing this laser isn't exactly difficult necessarily because as soon as you get the, uh, the lid off of your fat PS2, you can take this off of the top of the PS2's drive, and then you're looking directly at it. So fortunately replacing this isn't the hardest thing, but there are also like eight different lasers. So you gotta pick the right one. And that ladies and gentlemen is an unboxing and a look inside of the original fat PlayStation 2 system. Overall, I, I think it's not terrible to have to fix as long as it's just the disc drive. If you have to get down to this point, it's, uh, it's gonna be pretty frustrating, I think for a lot of people, but for the most part, the system itself is pretty cool. I think Sony put out a good system at a great time when the DVD boom was going on. They certainly took advantage of it and sold over 155 million systems doing it. And some of the games that came out were amazing. I mean, the, the library for the PS2 is nearly, is, is nearly endless. It, it's, there's so many games and the fact that it plays PS1 games as well, it's pretty cool. I just kind of wish the system maybe was a bit more sturdy, bit less delicate when it came to its disc drive, but I do think that's one of the main areas where they had to cut some corners to get it out at its price. Anyway, let me know what you guys think about the PlayStation 2 system. Did you have one back in the day? Maybe you got one recently and started picking up games for it or even started collecting again for it. Thanks guys for watching. Make sure you like the video on the way out if you enjoyed it, dislike it if not, and I'll see you next time.